We now go to a lone man in a barren wasteland, lamenting his misunderstanding of survival of the fittest. God, is this really all that's left? I've been through so much. I've seen so much horror. <laughs> Why? Why didn't I dig deeper to really understand what survival of the fittest means? I buried my wife, my kids. I thought if we all got buff, we could make it. But it wasn't enough. <laughs> my little buff kids. <laughs> we should have just hid. <sighs> my life is over. There's no one around. We killed the world. Warning. Wolves don't have alpha males in nature. Dominance isn't a major factor in human sexuality. And by Darwinian standards, the weak are often fitter than the strong. Story time. Welcome to Xenon Group Story Time. We are your child retention officers. We are here to teach you lessons about natural history and prepare you for the big world of capitalist society. Uh, yes, yeah. yeah, we're all very excited. It's a it's a big wide world out there, kids. And just okay, let me start with a question, children. If we were to release a pack of hungry, starving, enormous dogs right now mm -hmm. into the room to yep. attack all of you, children, uh, who do you think would survive? Which uh, uh, raise amongst, your hand amongst you. Raise your hand if you would survive. Oh, I see right. maybe one yeah. or two. Okay. No, I appreciate the humility, Jonathan, because I you would be called. So this basic principle, this principle of starving dogs, tearing children apart alive, that is one of the sort of foundational principles and driving principles of not just our economy, but our natural world. The very existential position we find ourselves in the universe is it's a dog eat dog world, basically. It's a red and tooth and claw war of all against all. And that's natural history. That's what's called natural selection or survival of the fittest. Yeah, it's dogs eating dogs, kids eating dogs, kids eviscerating dogs, dogs giving diseases to children, many things like Sometimes that. Sometimes it's kids eating kids when it comes down to it. Now just look to your left and look to your right and think, who would you throw to the dogs if it came to that? Yeah, and who would you eat if it came to that? Looking at you again, Jonathan. It's kill or be killed out there, children, and you want to make sure that you're doing the killing. Yeah, and this isn't just a pep talk, although it is that in part. This is also... A story time about the natural world. It's crucial to understand, children, that the history of our planet has been one racked with competition and selfishness from the most ancient times until today. This battle, this zero-sum fight for survival, this struggle for existence, pits child against child, dog against dog, and dog against child, and it works out what is optimally fit. It really is the beauty of nature that whenever you pit creatures against one another in competition, the ones who don't die are the best. You know, we can see this among birds, where big birds kill small birds, and we can see this in the ocean where sharks eat fish. And that's how we improve over time. That's how evolution improves over time. It's moving towards the ideal, perfect, creature. So if you're one of the children who didn't raise their hand, who would die from the pack of starving dogs, you can take comfort in knowing that you deserve it. And that's what evolution is. Right. You're participating in a natural process we inherited from nature. This isn't a social construction. This isn't us reading politics into the world and projecting our corporate values at Xenon Group, yada yada. No, this is objective. By culling the weakest children, humanity moves towards perfection. We're destined 
by nature to eventually conquer nature, basically. Absolutely. And we can reach that point both by directly murdering with our own two hands those who we can. Anyone who you can kill, you should. And also, though, you could just support policy that takes money and resources away from the poor to allow them to face a more natural death from impersonal forces. Right. That's like me. I was raised in, you know, we were a very tender home, sort of a little bit, you know, liberal home. And so, yes. I mean, personally, I don't want to kill people directly. I just want to set up an impersonal system that kills them eventually. That's the way we do things in my family. My family, kind of the opposite. We regularly had fights to the death. You know, we, it was a large family when I was born, much smaller family now, but a much stronger family. Yeah, stronger now. because of it, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, more fit, yeah. Uh, any questions, children? Uh, yeah, um, isn't cooperation a type of fitness in nature since Darwin was talking about survival and reproduction rather than physical fitness specifically? <laughs> Where do they come up with this stuff? <laughs> Uh, no. Cooperation is a scam. It's not real. See, you you try and cooperate, and then the more fit person in that cooperation is going to stab you in the back when you're not looking. That's the way of the world, children. And the harder you try to do it, the more the mighty are dragged down by the weak. Yada, yada, yada. The weak overpower the mighty. And then basically at the end, you have total apocalyptic loss of everything. That's why the powerful must seize control, get that knife, get it in the backs of his cooperators, yeah. and then try to reproduce as much as possible. You might think that we're up here cooperating right now, two representatives from the same company giving one presentation together, but the keen listener will notice we've been trying to subtly undermine each other this whole time. Absolutely. And I have plans within plans working in the background right now, hoping to eventually have this person killed. Absolutely. And the Xenon group encourages that kind of thing because it gets the best performance out of every individual educator. Oh yeah, absolutely. Isn't survival of the fittest kind of a tautology? Because the fittest definitionally refers to survivors? Doesn't it just mean the survival of the survivors? Not exactly, because you could have things that interfere with nature, like the welfare state or mm. people trying to help one another, all these sort of unnatural things that get in the way of the ruthless competition of true nature and keep people alive and kind of force them to survive when they're not meant to. Fitness is a kind of ideal that we've developed based on historical hierarchical ideologies. And it's not just that the survivors survive, it's that we want to make sure that the only people who survive are the ones that we say are fit. Only the strong survive is how nature works and how nature should work, but nature doesn't always live up to that. And that's why we need to step in to make sure nature's working as nature intended, as nature really works. <clears throat> I got a question. If, logically speaking, even if natural history was that way, that wouldn't necessarily say that that's how human beings should act. How do you transition from is to ought here? So you're saying it's good to be unnatural? You want to just walk up the wall right now, walk on the roof, breathe underwater much? Things are the way they are for a reason, little one. Yeah, we can say things ought to be the way that they aren't all day, and in the end it won't make a difference because they are. Oh, we ought are. to wear shoes on our head. Exactly. We ought to fly in the sky instead of being on the ground. We, we ought to evolve a pouch on our stomach for our little baby to sit in, like, like a kangaroo. kangaroo. Yeah. No. And kangaroos will be selected against in the long term. You mark my words. Why don't they just invent a cloth pouch to wear only when they need it, instead of wasting all those resources? Yeah. It's really unfit. Ruthless competition is like a technology that human beings fought and struggled to invent. And you taking the position that we just put it on the shelf and leave it behind? <laughs> Who even knows what happens to our genes at that point? I don't even want to think about it. Bad question. Bad student. So uh, should we release the hounds or? You know what? Let's do it. The herd looks like it needs to be thin. Your kid's like Fortnite, right? Well, this is a battle royale that you're going to remember for the rest of your lives. Here, let's pull this big lever. <laughs> Hello, my tautologically fit survivors, and welcome back to the Seriously Wrong Podcast. My name is Aaron. And my name is Sean. In case you're wondering what it means to be tautologically fit, uh, by definition, if you're alive listening to this, not only are you fit to survive, but all of your ancestors were fit to survive. So you come from a long line of totally fit, totally fit ancestors. So congratulations on that. Today we're talking about the survival of the fittest, uh, which is a term invented 
by the classical liberal Herbert Spencer and incorporated by Charles Darwin in only the fifth edition and beyond of his book on the origin of species. This episode was suggested by a listener, so thank you to everyone who sends ideas for episodes, and in particular, the person who submitted that idea. Really interesting topic, and we're, we're excited to talk about it. So just taking a really basic look at the sentence, survival of the fittest, when you're using that as a exchangeable term for natural selection, as it's kind of what it's meant to be initially, I think there's two important things to note, which is one, the word survival is a misnomer because it's not actually just about surviving, it's about reproducing. You could survive a really long time and not reproduce, and then you your genes wouldn't be passed on to the next generation if you don't produce. So it's not really about survival, it's more about reproduction. And then fitness is also a misnomer, or at least it's a pretty confusing term because people tend to think of fitness as something that resides within an organism or a person, like this person's fit, this person isn't. But really what fitness would mean would be best fitting into the environment or fitting into the environment in such a way as to allow for reproduction. So survival of the fittest, the only two words in there that aren't kind of confusing or messed up or wrong are of the. So I think just from a grammatical perspective, what it's trying to get across initially it doesn't really succeed at it very well. Yeah, Darwin used the term natural selection. His big insight basically was that we have all this incredible diversity of species on Earth, that all of this life actually came from a single origin. And it was through this process of small mutations and differentiation within the population at any given time being mediated by selective forces of which individuals within these species best fit their environment best are able to survive long enough to pass on their genetic information, that that process happening over a long enough time period created divergent species, created everything from turtles to human beings to fish to platypuses. They're all very different from each other, but they all came from the same place over a really, really long period of time. He called that natural selection. But he was running into this issue at the time, so this would be the 1860s, as people are starting to hear about and start to accept this theory, the term selection was confusing for certain people, and I think there was a little bit of motivated reasoning here, but people were making arguments like selection, you know, these atheist evolutionists don't recognize that selection is a process done by consciousness. It requires a selector, someone to be selecting. Right? Yeah, so they were saying like, oh, I'm open to natural selection, but it's God. And that wasn't Darwin's idea. Darwin's idea was that this was a very impersonal force that created this divergence over time. And Herbert Spencer used the term in his writings, survival of the fittest. Herbert Spencer was a philosopher and classical liberal who played around with the ideas in the evolution space, not from a scientific perspective, but more of a philosophical perspective, similar to like Lamarck, if you've heard of him. Someone wrote to Darwin saying like, hey, why don't you use this term so it can clear up this confusion about what natural selection means. And in the fifth edition, Darwin started using the term survival of the fittest. And he preferred it, in some sense, to natural selection because it cleared up that confusion about there being a selector. But it turned out that survival of the fittest over the long term created new, very different misinterpretations that were probably far more damaging. Because when you hear the word fittest, you think of like strong, buff, the, the biggest, the baddest, the fastest. It almost implies that nature selects for strength over weakness. And that's not Darwin's theory. That's not how evolution works in terms of what people who study evolution today think. Uh, but this is a persistent misconception that exists in popular culture, not just to the natural world, but in the way that we relate to each other as human beings. So it's very relevant today to unpack survival of the fittest, what it really means, where it came from, and how it's interpreted and applied to human society in ways that can be damaging. Yeah, because people kind of have this idea about what fitness means and like, yeah, it'll often be tied to physical strength, but who are the fittest can be described through a various, qual like, oh, a very industrious entrepreneurial leadership type, like maybe they're not physically strong, but or very intelligent people are the most fit. The idea is that like there are these intrinsic qualities to people that you can rank on a scale of better to worse, and there are these deep 
truths about the structure of the universe that mean that specific types of people and qualities are inherently good, which just isn't the case. Like the idea of fitness being those best adapted to a particular environment means that in many environments, cockroaches are more fit than human beings and cockroaches aren't physically stronger, more intelligent, maybe more industrious. I don't know how you'd measure cockroach industriousness versus human. I'm but willing to consider that. We'll give them that one. <laughs> They're industrious little critters. No leisure time for but, those guys. But that's not true either, because I understand that cockroaches can sometimes like just kind of shut down in a near hibernation state for a really long time and do nothing. And so like they're, hang they're out, chillers like, too. Yeah. Being able to chill for so long without needing anything in various situations could make you the most fit creature. So Right. Uh, yeah, I mean if if fitness is just surviving long enough to reproduce, sometimes running and hiding is the most fit thing to do. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Frequently. If you're a young, strong man who loves to lead Check. and Check. <laughs> fight and dominate others and oh, you, I noticed you stopped saying check, but you know, just Yeah, no, that, that's not me at all. <laughs> so you decide, oh, there's a battle for the glory of my nation going on. I'm going to go join the battle for the glory of my nation prior to ever reproducing mm -hmm. and then you die. You weren't very evolutionarily fit for that environment. The people who were cowards, who stayed at home or weren't allowed into the army or whatever, they were the mm -hmm. fit ones because they reproduced. Yeah, just, I mean, mathematically, say there's five run and hiders and five fighters, and the five fighters go and fight, and half of them die, then it's like a, you know, three-fifths chance that fighting is an evolutionary liability where all five hiders may survive and be able to reproduce in that specific context in another context say that you have the same 10 people but they really like each other and they have strong social ties they form a group together decide that the fighters will be there in case someone tries to attack them for self-defense only. It's good to have some fighters around, but we also like having the ability to run and hide when necessary so that we can avoid fighting most of the time. Uh, and in that situation, all 10 of them might survive. They might be made more fit through their decision to hide even when they could fight to hide when they could fight and to have some fighters around in case it's absolutely necessary in some situations. So having that diversity within the group and the social bonds within the group to work together, that increases the fitness of all of the people in the group without changing their genetics at all. It's just, just changing the way they relate to their environment. Yeah. And just one final thought experiment here. Imagine if, you know, among human beings, women were much, much larger than men, like say 100 or 200 times bigger than men. And there was a limited That's amount a, some of big women, big, big Titan Amazonian 50 foot woman scenario. And there's a limited amount of resources. So if men started evolving through their natural variation to sometimes be taller and use more resources, they may have less fitness opportunities if they have to start competing with these 50 foot women. And what might be evolutionary most beneficial is for these tiny men to latch onto the side of these enormous women to bite them and stay hanging off the side of them so long, vomiting sperm into their body that their mouth fuses to the outside of the woman's body. Certain types of anglerfish are like that. I found out last night. <laughs> <laughs> it might, you know, it's not PC to say, <laughs> but sometimes fitness is men being very tiny and vomiting sperm into an enormous woman that their body fuses with. The diversity of nature is beautiful, isn't it, folks? Yeah, and if there was ever a situation where there, there was a radiation flash and all men on the planet were somehow rendered incapable of producing sperm, then the most evolutionary fit behavior that might have existed were the people who decided to freeze sperm before that. So if you didn't jerk off into a cup and freeze it, you're know, some of you lack in this situation. <laughs> I mean, doing that in any, like donating to a sperm bank makes you more, evolutionarily speaking, reproductively speaking, makes you more fit to reproduce because it's just more likely you're going to pass on your genes if you do that. Right. No, in the long run of history, the genetic material that happens to be in the men who happen to make the choice to donate sperm 
will have a larger impact in general on the human genome than the men who didn't choose to do that. So that's what survival means. That's what fitness means when you're using these terms. It's a bit, it's a bit of a misnomer. It's a bit confusing for most people, but coming in cups, being tiny men on giant women, uh, being a cockroach, all these things are very fit. Being That's what uh, Darwin was talking about. <laughs> it is what Darwin was talking about. Exactly. Running so, and hiding. Running and hiding. Running and hiding to go come in a cup and freeze it. We found this monkey in the jungle, and when it, when it's about to die, it will jerk off in a cup and hide it deep in a cave. That's an incredible evolutionary strategy. Think of how much easier it would be to bring back the dinosaurs for Jurassic Park if they had all come into cups and froze them in, like, the Arctic or something. 2020 for, hindsight. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's why we made it and they didn't. Let's just be honest. True. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Natural Selection. This week, our natural making a selection is Midge Finkus. She's a primary school teacher and water polo lover who lives in Wrongsville with her wheezing and grunting pug. Thanks for being here, Midge. Thanks for having me. My pug was actually selected for by artificial selection, and that's why it has such a scrunched up face and wheezes like this. That's fascinating to hear. Now, let's meet these genetic specimens Midge, we've had your suitors this week stripped down to their britches and oiled up so Ooh. you can inspect every nook and cranny of their fitness. Nice. And remember, Midge, you're this week's natural, so this selection is up to you. Uh -huh, I'll do my best. Hi, my name is Dirk. I came on this show to find true love. I'm a yoga instructor and a Darwinist influencer, and my greatest dream is to invent a time machine so that someday I can unlock the secrets of evolution firsthand. Mmm, Dirk's looking good, huh? Mm -hmm. Hi, my name's Kieran. I'm looking for the girl of my dreams to start a big family. I want like a dozen kids, and I want my kids to start having kids quickly too. I want to be a great, great, great grandfather before I die. We need to give our genes a head start in this world by reproducing often and reproducing young. I'm a stockbroker and I run a YouTube channel about investing. Mm -hmm. Bite me off a piece of Kieran Rar. Uh, hi, my name is Badge and I'm looking for real love. I'm not here to play games. I'm a security guard and a debate streamer and nothing thrills me more than a Darwinian battle of tooth and claw on Twitch fighting ideas against one another, where only the strong survive. Badge is buff and sharp as a whip. This is gonna be one hard selection, Midge. How are you feeling? Oh, this is, they're all so fit. I just, I wanna select them all. It doesn't work that way, Midge. So let's narrow this field down with some objective scientific statistics. Now, Midge, if you open up your console there, you'll see we've run a battery of tests on these young specimens, testing physical strength and endurance, intelligence, sperm count, and all the necessary vitals. From these tests, we've calculated what we call a fitness quotient, a single number which encompasses the entirety of their fitness. Are you ready for the reveal? Oh, yes, please. I need something to help me narrow this down. Oh, sorry, Midge. They all have an equal fitness quotient, an FQ of 108. Oh, schnuts. I don't, I don't, oh, no. No one said this would be easy, Midge. The selection is up to you. Uh, 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 um, okay, I've, I'm going to just have to go with my gut here. Um, I've made my pick. I'm ready to sterilize. Now Midge will get her two vials of sterilization juice and prepare the needle for the two unlucky hunks. I'll just pull back the plunger here get, and flick it so the bubbles go to the top. Kieran, you seem like a really great, really interesting guy. Your vitals, very good. Your FQ, impressive, honestly, but sometimes you just get unlucky. You're not my natural selection. No hard feelings. And I'll just uh, inject that serum well, in just a pinch. There we go. This is hard for everyone, but it is the way of nature. All right, down to two now, and Dirk, 
You've honestly impressed me since the moment you first walked in here. I was thinking that maybe you were my special one to do yoga and grow old with, but unfortunately nature is cruel and sometimes your genes just won't get passed on. You are not my natural selection. Uh, namaste. I accept it. And I'll just inject that here and I hope that your time travel project is a success. And so that just leaves us with Badge. You are my natural selection. You're so fit. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hey. Isn't it beautiful, folks? We've recreated what happens in nature, but here in the social realm for your entertainment. That's all we have this week, and remember, all of our contestants shared the majority of their genetic information with one another because we're all the same species. And as always, make sure your pets are not fit in the Darwinian sense by getting them spayed and neutered. Bye, everyone. So in a contemporary sense, you'll often run into the term survival of the fittest in context of like competition between people or competition between maybe even like countries. Yeah, or even companies. The most fit company will survive in the marketplace and yeah, reproduce. And it's, <laughs> it's used kind of synonymously with the phrase like, it's a dog eat dog worlds. That's like a more folksy <laughs> version of the same concept, which is like the world is a tough place. People have to fight each other. You need to be strong to overcome other people in order to survive and thrive in this world. Yeah, it's kind of like the struggle for existence from economist Thomas Malthus. So the Malthusian idea that we're all in this struggle for existence with one another. It's also used as a sort of invocation against morality sometimes. Like Yeah, or, or appealing to a might makes right morality. And it's like saying this is moral. Mm -hmm. And your petty, oh, it should be this way is... It's out of touch with the natural world. It's yeah. out of touch with the universe outside of us, which has these principles that separate the wheat from the chaff through this ruthless competition. And don't be sentimental about the people we lose along the way, because this is just nature running its course. That sort of crap. Yeah, and this softness that you see as morality, as taking care of people, will actually make things worse. Giving people too much welfare makes them dependent on welfare, and then they can't provide for themselves anymore. You know, hard times breed strong men. <laughs> strong men create good times. Good times breed weak men, etc. Classic fascist nursery rhyme. Right. So talking about kind of the contemporary usage of survival of the fittest, applying more towards just society and how people interact more so than it's applying to actually talking about evolution like there's a continuum between the sort of capitalist market ideology of it's a dog eat dog world out there and you got to go out and win in the marketplace and the more fascist end of the spectrum with fascist nursery rhyme of these hard times creating stronger men to make better societies in the future and kind of the history of that or like one of the vectors that that came through us in history is like Darwin created this idea of natural selection, which is that different environments select for different qualities in animals that causes speciation over time. And then this is taken by people like Herbert Spencer and applied to the social realm. Uh, and I find it really interesting that Herbert Spencer is seen as the sort of progenitor father figure of social Darwinism and also a progenitor father figure of the right-wing libertarian movement. Because a lot of people on the right wing now want to draw this very harsh distinction between right-wing libertarian anti-government ideologies and fascist ideologies, eugenics ideologies, the ideologies of Hitler and Mussolini and other authoritarian right-wing fascist groups, but they have these direct ties through history and they're coming from this same place. The idea that we should not give charity to the poor because doing so is interfering with their natural deaths that would occur otherwise and that we should go in in a top-down approach and sterilize people, cull people in some instances, mur like murder, mass murder, genocide people who we've deemed to be unfit is just deeply ideologically tied together. And that tension is even there in Spencer himself. Like he said in one of his early works on this, 
He argues that imperialism served civilization by clearing these inferior races off the earth, but then at the same time tries to say, but this isn't a justification for doing that. I'm against imperialism. It was just the effects of it were really good, but that doesn't mean that we should do it. Debate bro move. <laughs> Which, yeah, <laughs> total debate bro move. That like, I guess you can hold that position, but you're still starting from this same premise of the Malthusian struggle for existence and strength being good. Like, you've already decided who's fit, what's natural, which environment is the environment that we think people should be acclimatized to. Yeah, it is the case that a lot of these ideas, these hierarchical naturalist ideas that ended up being identified with survival of the fittest and sort of like social Darwinist ideas and Herbert Spencer's arguments for laissez-faire political economics and soon after eugenic ideas were actually kind of like repeats of earlier ideas from earlier eras that worked for the powerful and the elite to be able to exert a naturalization of their dominance. You can trace all this stuff directly to the hundred years or so leading up to the advent of evolution as a cultural force. Like Thomas Malthus argues in the 1790s that we shouldn't give charity to the poor because it will result in overpopulation. And the guys who are against giving charity to the poor were like, fuck yeah, Malthus nailed it. And then like 70 years later, Herbert Spencer shows up on the scene and he's like, we shouldn't give charity to the poor because nature wants the fit to thrive and the unfit to perish. And they're like, oh, yeah, fuck yeah, like finger snapping and shit. And being be like, Spencer, you're the Aristotle of our age. But it's like, this is a pre existing, long standing idea. Th this idea of like a competitive hierarchical naturalism benefits the powerful in any given context. Yeah, it's taking, again, this idea of fitness, which only makes sense in evolutionary terms when it's tethered to an environment, fitness to this particular environment, and smuggling in their own ideals of fitness that had already pre-existed that, of being not mentally ill, being strong, being heterosexual, smuggling that ideal in as, oh, that's what fitness is. Fitness is these ideas that we've already had for a really long time. There's no reason to say that providing people with welfare causes people to become less fit within the logic of the original Darwinian statement, because that's just a change in the environment and change. Like it's making people more fit to put them on welfare from the perspective of what fitness should mean in an evolutionary argument. You're increasing their ability to survive, likely increasing their ability to reproduce. This would be making humanity more fit. The only way that the argument that you're interfering with what is natural by giving charity to the poor makes any sense is if you've already decided that these people are unfit to begin with and that you've already decided that it's unnatural to give them money to begin with. Otherwise, what is natural is just what is, like the, their, their fitness for the particular environment that they're in, which could include giving them welfare. So there's kind of like an is-ought jump happening there where Darwin's trying to describe the world as it is, as it relates to butterflies, grasses, turtles, and so on, and the diversity of that world. And he's saying that nature tends to select for certain things that cause survival and that survival creates differentiation among species fascinating argument that has proven to be true. So yeah, in the era of post-Darwin, post-evolutionism, post-survival of the fittest, you know, the 1860s and on, this is a time called the Gilded Age, named after a story by Mark Twain about that era. But it was a time of enormous wealth inequality. The, the gap between the rich and the poor was at an enormous level. Society was ruled by like robber barons, who, you know, would drink out of crystal flutes, everything in their life gilded with gold while the poor Oliver Twist types are starving on the street outsides and so on. So naturally, the rich and powerful of this era wanted an ideology that would justify and naturalize their rule. And through the ideas of social Darwinism and the idea of survival of the fittest, they found a compelling way to reframe inherited ideas about natural hierarchy and say, we want to create a politics that helps nature run its course. So one version of that is like laissez-faire political economics of like hands off, no welfare for the poor, only private charity, like 
that sort of argument, they could put on the veneer of science. They could say, this is actually a scientific thing. It's a scientific thing to not help the poor. Humans should be more humble than to intervene in the natural affairs of nature, which say that the poor must die. That's the first sort of subcategory. And then the second subcategory is actively trying to facilitate the development of the human population through eugenic means, which is like restricting the reproduction of undesirables, deciding who is degenerate and who is not degenerate, and then sterilizing the degenerates, making them unfit to pass on their genetics for future generations. Like, I think you're exactly right. Like they had a pre-existing idea of what the poor were worth, the quote unquote unfit. They had pre-existing views on that. And then they were given a scientific terminology that they can sort of like grab and run with in that environment. Before the period of evolutionism and Darwin, these were typically like religious arguments of natural hierarchy, a great chain of being. Yeah, God has chosen the strong to lead, and some people have terrible fates because of God's plan. And you know. So like a good example of this is the idea of degeneracy, which you may have seen like really far right people mention online. Degeneracy is an idea that started in like the early 1700s. And the basic idea was that there was a certain class of people, a certain subgroup of people that were degenerates. And the symptoms of degeneracy, the first sort of identified symptom was compulsive masturbation. But that extended to mental illness, and they use the term insanity, criminality, alcoholism, or a term they used, economic degeneracy, which means being poor and unable to lift yourself up. This was a hierarchical category that was invented long before evolution came along. Yeah, the masturbation thing, again, is an example of smuggling in your own ideas of fitness because, as we've previously stated, masturbating, especially into a cup if you're going to freeze it, uh, is a very evolutionarily fit thing to do. Today's episode of Seriously Wrong is brought to you by Survival of the Fittest Fitness, your one-stop shop for beefing up, getting strong, improving that reproductive fitness, and ensuring that your genetics will be passed on for generations to come. At Survival of the Fittest Fitness, we believe in natural selection. We believe in separating the wheat from the chaff. So we implement that at every level of our fitness regimen. The weakest gym patrons, sorry, you're not allowed to get a membership anymore. You're too weak, get out of here. Wheat from the chaff. Our own trainers and coaches are in a ruthless competition with one another, fighting to the metaphorical death to the right to train you an incredible gym going experience. The founding idea of our gym is that survival of the fittest is a law of nature, that physical fitness and strength is what causes you to survive. Uh, excuse me, I, I couldn't help but notice you were filming this commercial here. I was kind of eavesdropping. Oh, perfect, a passerby. Look, I can show my uh, skills at bringing people into the gym. So it's called survival of the fittest fitness, and we use the laws of nature to help people train better. So if I don't get gains, are you gonna kill me? Is that the idea? No, no, we don't have the political power to do that exactly, but we will terminate your gym membership and you won't be welcome to compete with the best of them and become fit and pass on your genes to future generations is sort of the goal. So right. we won't help but you do that anymore. I. I'm just missing part of the connect, cause like I could have kids and not get a membership at your gym really, and I get a membership at any gym really easily, like... Well, we won't stop people who don't go to our gym from having kids. We just won't help them to be fit and produce wider broods for future generations. Wider as per the broods? Wider, wider, like larger broods. Some more children? More okay. children, yeah, just like Charles Darwin predicted in his scientific theory, survival that of the fittest. people who worked out would have more children? Yes, the that's, strong will dominate the weak and reproduce more and... That's not what Charles Darwin, that's not what survival of the fittest means. Like, it doesn't just mean that you have the most muscles. It means that you're... I thought it did mean that. ...fit to reproduce. Like... Right. You could be the skinniest... Like, sexy. Well, sure. Fit but to reproduce. You, you could be Darwin's incredibly idea. skinny and have a large brood. Like, you, like, no muscles at all. Like, yeah, good luck. I mean, it's, it's not... They're not actually connected, right? Like... Oh, I'd say they're connected. Our, anyone who goes to our gym will tell you they're connected. They start buffing up, they start reproducing. I mean, I already have a gym membership, so I'm not going to join. And you have, like, a weird ideology and, like... I just heard that over... It's a dominant ideology. It's very common. Kind of. Yeah, I mean... There's a major misunderstanding of survival of the fittest that is 
widespread and yours is kind of like an even more misunderstood version like like you seem very focused on just physical fitness oh i do run a gym right which is, makes perfect sense but it's just not wait are you saying that there's like a philosophical problem with my interpretation yeah i honestly don't even understand your interpretation like if your gym was about forcing people to compete and then somehow preventing them from reproducing by sterilizing them or man's a gym expansionist i love it but no gyms don't have that kind of power well i know but that's just doesn't have anything to do with reproduction really unless you're just saying people who work out are more attractive which sure like that's the beauty standard in society right now generally but i mean if you just want to attract certain people who like identify with being predators or the winners of the survival game or something you can do that. No, no, I it's, guess, it's important it's, to me that this is actually laws of nature. No, I mean, in nature, the fittest thing to do in certain situations might be not to work out at all. What's fit is what helps you reproduce and survive in a given context. It's not like a right inherent thing. And it's definitely not just physical fitness. That's just kind of a misnomer. Like, oh man, it means to fit into an environment. What? I just opened this gym. Well, I mean, I made a 10-year like, marketing strategy. Oh, uh, yeah, that's down the drain. You could just change the signage, though. Or I, I, just call I it... Super what's Bowl. your name? Sorry. Chris. Chris. You could just call it Chris's Gym. Fuck. That's such a good name for a gym. There's no ideology. <sighs> Fuck. Why didn't I look this up first? So you're saying it's not about being strong? No. I mean, in, like, in some environments, being strong could help. But Do you think in others, it works as it a could... pun, or is it more stupid? Uh, I don't know. It's, it's a weird pun because survival implies, like, I thought this was like a death gym or something or a murder gym. You keep no, saying it's, it's not, not that at all. Uh, or no, a sterilization I'm... gym or. No, what? I would never do that at my gym. Or on the other hand, it could just be a gym where you encourage people to like freeze their genetic materials for future generations, but it has nothing to do with working out at all. Sorry, what's your name? Uh, Andy. Andy, you're a genius. Thank you. I can you. still preserve my marketing plan. I'm just going to have to make a few tweaks and invest in some big, deep freezers. Things are going to be all right. Thank you, Andy. You're uh, the smartest man I've ever spoken to. You just changed my life. No, no problem. Uh, do, do you want a free gym membership one month off? Is, we'll wait, is it going to be a gym or is it just going to be a like a sperm bank? I'm still confused. <laughs> It's a combo gym sperm bank. So we help optimize the sperm and then we store it. I don't think you can optimize <laughs> sperm like oh, that. Oh, well, I'm going to be looking into that. And I think you can. I mean, maybe there's some things you could do. I don't know. I haven't looked understand into sperm how much optimization I've myself. But. I've put so much money into this fucking marketing plan. If this doesn't work, I am broke for life. Are you with me? One month free membership? You can be part of my, you know, man on the street. I convinced you on camera. We're running this ad. Are you in? Oh, yeah, I don't consent to being in the ad, by the way. What? I was just critiquing the ad. No, we got to run this. This is all great stuff. Well, maybe we can talk about it afterwards. Maybe we can reach an agreement. Andy is a genius, and he has helped revolutionize my business. And I'll have him as a business partner. I'll have him as a member. It's up to him. Okay, you can get your first month free if you sign up for Survival of the Fittest Fitness. And our slogan, optimize that sperm, then freeze it. Proud sponsor of Seriously Wrong. No, but it, it, I mean, yeah, it's, just, it's true. Compulsively masturbating can be an evolutionary fit thing to do. It, yeah, it just goes to show you, you can't assume. Or that if you are assuming it's part of a political project, that yeah. That we're governed by the common sense of our time. Yeah. Another thing they thought, by the way, is that compulsive masturbation would give you tuberculosis and turn you into an atheist. That idea of degeneracy was then reformed in evolutionary language in the form of the idea of dysgenics, was the idea that people could move on an evolutionary trajectory away from the ideal fitness and towards the generations of humanity, basically. This sort of vulgarized, hierarchical idea of survival of the fittest and natural selection became this sort of like secular, pseudoscientific appeal to the natural world framing that was used to make these same hierarchical arguments again in new ways. And what resulted from that is one of the most disturbing implementations of hierarchical naturalism, I think, 
in history, which is the eugenics movement. The eugenics movement was a horrific and prolonged chapter in the history of you know our last century and a half. Also, of all things considered, a very recent invention. It was like a racist, utopian movement to shape the evolution of humanity, which was like survival of the fittest ideology, really tended to be centered around the United States. Although there was eugenics movements in a variety of countries, the context in the United States of being this settler colonial state with racial hierarchy, with dispossessed indigenous people, with a massive wealth gap, with monopolization happening, buyouts of the political class by the industrialist class, all that context made eugenics really appealing, especially to the rich and powerful. So you see, like, in the time that eugenics became most popular, which is in the first half of the 20th century, eugenics was taught in universities, like the top universities in the United States, the ones that you'd recognize the names of today, Stanford, Harvard, etc. There were eugenics courses where eugenics which is like the selective breeding of humans to shape human evolution, was taught in school as a scientific course decades before there was major political movements around this. These ideas appealed to the rich and the powerful first. Yeah, I was reading a bit about how much eugenics had kind of soaked into the popular culture by the 1930s. Like there was like this movie with Katherine Hepburn in it where basically she does the right thing at the end by deciding to never have kids because her father is genetically insane. And they also describe kind of like madcap comedies about eugenics. And yeah, I just found it really interesting. Like this book I was reading a bit, Popular Eugenics, it's a collection of essays. And like, well, yeah, one of the points being made was that even though scientific interest in eugenic ideas was already on the decline by the 1930s in terms of like it being a legitimate thing that people thought might make sense. The popular culture ripples it was having were still very widely being felt. And I feel like they're still being felt today. Like just the other day I was on Twitter seeing someone saying that Idiocracy is literally a documentary. And for those of you who don't know, Idiocracy is a movie about how too many stupid people are having babies and not enough smart people. It's premised on the same presumptions as the eugenics movement. This is editing Aaron jumping in here quickly. I said this like a couple weeks ago now we recorded this, but then just yesterday, Elon Musk made the exact same tweet that I was just complaining about seeing some random person make. And he got like 70k likes on it. So yeah, it just, this stuff is alive and well on Twitter, uh, coming from, in this case, the richest man in the world. Eugenics ideology motivated in part by the Spencerist or social Darwinist interpretation of survival of the fittest. They advance policies like the isolation of the unfit from the general population, sterilization, ceasing charity to the poor, opposition to immigration, and harsh punitive justice because they thought that criminality was genetically determined. There was actually a guy in the late 1800s who released, he, he called it homo delinquens, and he claimed that like criminality could be measured in the skull and that it was like a dysgenic subrace of humanity. He presented this idea straight-faced, he got applause from all the usual suspects, and they believed that shit was literally true. Right. Yeah. It reminds me of there's this famous statuette of the average young American male that was created based on measurements taken of army recruits. And it was displayed prominently at, I believe, the second and third international eugenics conferences. But at the second one, it was also displayed beside a little statuette that was created based on measurements of the top 50 Harvard athletes instead. And it was kind of like the olden days eugenics conference statuette based version of those memes you see around nowadays where like they're the like chat and virgin. Oh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, I didn't even think of that, but it is exactly chat and version. Yeah, <laughs> I was thinking more of the like, oh, 1980s picture of a buff guy. And then like today, a weak looking guy, they're both with their shirts off and they're like, oh, people, it's what like, this, <laughs> like, it's really ridiculous meme material. But uh, yeah, being presented at these eugenics conferences is like, look at what genetics is doing to our average US conscript. They're nowhere near as athletic as Harvard's top 50 athletes. So basically, they're, they're projecting their cultural values and ideas using a pseudoscientific frame 
to argue that to make like these are very familiar sort of fascistic arguments that you see today in fascist circles. If you look at spaces where like the far right congregates online, they're reproducing these like classic ideas these greatest hits of hierarchical naturalism throughout history today. Yeah. And based partially on this fictitious idea of survival of the fittest, where, yeah, and they're just quite literally showing. I mean, it's not a misinterpretation of survival of the fittest. It's to some degree like a knowing reinterpretation to push a political perspective. The eugenics movement, I mean, it basically more or less led to Hitler. Like it more or less led to this master race ideology, the mass execution of Jewish people. During the Holocaust, they also targeted Roma people, the disabled, homosexuals. And it's all built on the same logic of hierarchical naturalism. Um, and what they did in the U.S. wasn't much better either. I mean, I mean, it was a scale better. I don't know where the, the high ground is on this. Amer America did some really horrific shit as well, uh, based on these same ideas. A variety of eugenic policies were implemented in the United States, including eugenic sterilization of thousands and thousands of people, but especially young, poor women. Some of the first immigration restrictions, because they showed in Congress that foreigners had lower IQ, according to their tests. Yeah, both American and Nazi implementations of eugenic ideology. Incredibly horrifying. Hard to rank them. If you had to, probably Nazis worse, but both incredibly horrifying. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention, to you you mentioned the thing about social Darwinism being a kind of utopian movement in certain ways. And that was the other thing I found reading up about Spencer. He believed that over the course of many generations, the evolutionary process would ensure that human beings would become less aggressive and increasingly altruistic, eventually leading to a perfect society in which no one would ever cause another person pain. Again, at the same time, that he's explicitly running defense for imperialism, saying that it had a good effect on this process towards this utopian future that he's imagining. So it's like, yeah, like going back to the fascist nursery rhyme, and even going back to in like past episodes, we talked about Ayn Rand's vision of utopia and like what's utopian to her. And it, it just feels like a lot of these right wing utopian people, their vision of like how to get to a much better society always involves a lot of people dying, either through intentional action or the withdrawal of action. Like in Atlas Shrugged, all the productive people kind of run away to the mountains and let society collapse around them without all the billionaires that society collapses. And then in the fascist nursery rhyme, the weak men create the bad times. So it's through those bad times, through all the death and the horror and whatever, that again, the strong men will rise and create the good society again. So there's this strain through this version of utopian thinking they have that always tends to seem to involve a lot of death and culling of people. We now go to the Social Ecological Barbershop. Welcome. Hey there, come in. Hi. Yeah. You, you in here to get that haircut, that old mop? Look at you. Uh, yeah, yes, please. Uh, the usual. Just have a seat. Have a seat. Here, I'll put the bib on. Yeah, you got to come in here more often. Looking a little shaggy there. Yeah, so what were we talking about last time? Where did we leave off on your social ecological conversation about... Oh, yeah, I remember. I was telling you about how... We're utopians in social ecology, but, you know, that doesn't mean that being a utopian is inherently a good thing all the time. Like, people could have an idea of a utopian future that's horrible to live in. Being a utopian doesn't mean you just co-sign every single possible utopia, right? Right. Look, regressive movements have taken utopian ideas and pointed them towards cruel and evil ends in the past. And they did it because the hope and action that utopianism can inspire is effective. The original neoliberals were utopians. Ayn Rand was a utopian. The eugenics movement was utopian. Doesn't mean they're good. Okay. But still, if you want to move society forward in a positive direction towards better societies, you have to imagine better possible futures. Okay. Utopianism is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Okay. It needs to be democratic, ecological, provide for people's basic needs, pursue technology ecologically, provide post-scarcity standard of living through use of Fructian library lending system, perhaps. Okay. 
and the means need to reflect the ends. We can't go about some horrible way of doing things to arrive at better ends. We need to build the better future we want as we move towards it. That's good utopianism. That's that's what this social ecological barber endorses. Okay. And just tilt your head forward a bit here, and I'll get the back of your neck with the electric razor. Oh, it tickles. And uh, I'll just wipe that off, hit it with the little thing there. There you go, kid. You look like a million bucks. Oh, no, yeah, it looks good. Any questions? Questions about that haircut you always get? Or questions about the utopianism stuff? Uh, no, I, I think I'm good. Thanks. Okay, then. All right, we'll see you next time. Hey, keep the keep the change. Oh, thanks. It's a nice tip. Uh, you know what, kid? You got a great deal today. You got both socialism and barbarism all in <laughs> one go. Get it? Barbarism? Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, bye. Bye. Papa and boy. Papa, Papa, what does survival of the fittest mean? Oh boy, that's a great question. Survival of the fittest is another way of saying natural selection. Uh, it's a little bit sort of archaic term in the sciences now. More modern terms for the same concept would be reproduction of the fittest or differential selection. There's been kind of like this euphemism treadmill game uh, with talking about natural selection, trying to find something that has the least weird implications because people keep on running with the weirdest implications and just, it's kind of bad when you look at it. Uh, eugenics movement, have you heard about this? Most ableist shit I ever heard of. Horrible. But uh, Darwin was basically right about differential selection. It's a, it's a process where tiny mutations in plants and animals little tiny random mutations stack up over thousands of generations in a dialectical interplay with the material conditions of the environment that they're in and that process creates different species as wildly different as from koalas to deep sea fish to birds dinosaurs and papas and boys like me and you oh wow let me just start with the most basic example. You know butterflies, beautiful butterflies? Oh yeah, I love butterflies. So imagine that butterflies have no natural predators and no one's trying to eat them. These butterflies have different wing colors. They have all these different wing colors, all these beautiful different wing colors. Pretty. Right, but let's say that the material conditions, their environment changes. Maybe they live in a forest and they get a really aggressive predator coming into that forest that wants to eat butterflies. Well, in that case, the differential selection that's happening there is that predation is making it easier to survive as a butterfly if your wings' colors match the foliage of the forest you're in because they can camouflage themselves. Right. But imagine things change in a different way. Maybe they're in a desert. Then the colors that are selected for in that environment against those predators would be matching desert colors. Or if there was an ice age, Maybe white would be selected for it, to hide against the snow. Like, that's why polar bears are white, because they hide amongst the snow. Right. And Darwin's big idea about natural selection and the species, the origin of species, as he said, is that if this big group of butterfly goes into multiple different environments at once, separating, they could be selected for all those different things at the same time, and over a long enough timeline, because they're in these insular genetic communities, you can have different species of butterflies that evolve in the direction of whatever the environment calls for, whatever survival environment they're in, that they differentiate themselves enough that they become different species entirely. And that's the process that gave rise to pigs, human beings, deep sea fish, tardigrades, all the animals and plants, fungus, everything that we know and love in the natural world is a result of this process over a very long time frame. That was Darwin's big idea. And that's what's meant by survival of the fittest in the most scientific sense. Okay, yeah, that makes perfect sense, Papa. That's so helpful. Um, does it mean that we should go out and kill anyone who isn't fit to kind of help Whoa. evolution along? No, no, Jesus Christ. But where do you come up with this stuff? Oh, my God. You're grounded. Well, I mean, don't, don't we no, want to no, make No, no, you're not bringing this fit? shit into my house, boy. Okay, fine. That's a horrible thing to say. What's wrong with you? I thought I'd raise you to be a good boy. It seems logical. I don't... No, that is not logical. Jesus Christ, no. I was just asking a question. I don't know. I didn't, well, sometimes, you're, sometimes it's not a just child, a question. You yeah, know, well, mind just... of a child. I don't know about that. I don't know where you pick this crap up, but it's not welcome in this house. You could have just said, oh, boy, no, actually, it works like this. When I'm taking parenting lessons from you, it stops here. I don't want to hear that crap again. Papa and boy. Ow. 
after the wrong apocalypse. The year is 2312 AD. The world has fallen into chaos. Warring factions of raiders are engaged in generations-long conflict for Darwinian supremacy over this apocalyptic, barren landscape where the forests have all been wiped out because nature has been ravaged by human activity for hundreds of years, food and water is scarce, and it's a life-or-death, tooth-and-claw battle for survival. The war of all against all, fighting each other for gasoline, and just like, the world is just like, fucked. Okay? That's what's going on here. The world is fucked. We now go to two weenery little weaklings, who aren't expected to live much longer, as they wait their turn to fight to the death for a cheering audience as a mandatory rite of passage. Hi. Hey, yeah. Uh, it's exciting to be here, hey? Like, I've come here since I was a kid just to watch people fight to the death and cheer and separate. Oh, yeah, I love it. I love fighting. Gotta separate that chaff. Yeah. Keep the wheat. Yeah. You better hope we don't fight each other. Yeah. Because I will. You'll be the chaff. Yeah, I'll turn you to chaff in a second. Yeah, right? you you wish. Oh, uh, what uh, a great system! I'm so excited to be here today to fight a life and death battle for survival for a cheering audience. I think it's making things better, society better, as we all decided. You know, it's, uh, the justifications for it, I think, make sense. Yeah, the fittest tend to survive, right? Like the best. Yeah, and definitionally the fittest survive, so. So often I'm just looking out at the landscape, obviously seeing the roving bands of raiders driving around in their spiked vehicles with weapons, fighting each other and trying to steal me from my family to sell me into slavery and that sort of stuff. It's always been really positive. I think it's great. I think it's a great system and a great ideology. It was great. I guess I'm just so used to it because it's our culture, but I really like it. Hey, do you ever think that maybe things would be better. No, I don't know. I... Oh, I think I know what you're getting at. Those maniacs who say that everyone for themselves doesn't work and that causes the society to collapse in the first place and people should learn to cooperate against the barren environment instead. Those nuts, I know exactly what you're talking about. I hate that stuff. Yeah, no, I just... <sighs> You know, sometimes you wonder, like, what are we becoming fit for? The ideas will become fit, and then things will keep getting better, but we're becoming more fit for more of this. You know what I'm saying? Like, the cruelty, the most murder, the mo you know, like... Whereas maybe that's not the thing we want to become fit for. This is what they say, anyway. Yeah, and to that I would say, that's the way the universe is and that is what it is and we have to live in sync with the natural world to which they might respond with something outrageous and just frankly silly like it benefits everyone to cooperate and there's no significant scarcity of opportunity that requires this constant culling of people from our society it would be better if we work together they'd probably say something like that and then I would just like totally shake my head no and say what is up with this sorry can I just confess something really quick yeah, who's stopping you? Just between you and me, I completely agree with all that stuff. I think this society is kind of fundamentally broken, and I mean, we're probably going to die out there, right? Uh, like, yeah. You know, I, neither of us... I don't know be if real, I go that real, far. Be real. We might make it, but like... You yeah, seen we might some make the, it. No, you've seen some of these other fucking guys. Well, yeah, okay. Killing I'm, machines. Okay, yeah, just between you and me, maybe they have a point. That creating a harsh environment to take out big chunks of humanity and like narrow the differences between us to a very specific set of traits that can survive in this type of battle environment. I do wonder sometimes if there's another way, that like a better way, like if we should be fitting people into something else, into some other way of doing things, you know? Yeah, okay, listen, we don't have much time and we probably can't do it alone, but what if we both squeeze through these bars with our tiny bodies and booked it tried to get one of those like war cars hit the road if one of us just runs they'll probably kill us but if we stick together we might be able to run and hide and escape and live long enough to try to figure out a way to survive together yeah we could come up with schemes to stay alive together you know two heads are better than one right what do we got to lose right I, everything i've learned since i was a child is telling me that this is a horrible idea, but on the other hand, we're probably going to be killed anyway. So what, like, what do we have to lose? And I think you're right. We could squeeze between these bars. Yeah, we either struggle for existence in there, or we struggle for existence out there. 
Do you want to go first, or should I go first? I'm kind no, of go first. I'll yeah, go I first. Think, yeah, I was worried that if I went first, you would call the guards on me and like kind of oh, take God. out the competition early. But that wouldn't. I think work. we have to. We have to try. If, if we're anyone, do I'd this, prefer to fight you than these guys. True. Yeah. Do you want to squeeze through the bars? So. Way Ooh. ahead of you. Here we go. <sighs> yeah. That was easy. Okay, let's go jank one of those spiky weapon cars and hit the road pillaging. That's a great idea. Spiky car. Keep people away from us. By the way, what was your name? My name is Slavdar the Merciless. Ah, uh, Slavdar. Okay, yeah. No, my name's Blundo the Blood Drinker. Blood Drinker. Cool. Is that yeah. like a family name? Or did you drink blood? It's a family name. Someone drank blood and history really said they did, but, you know. Cool. Yeah, someone was merciless in my family, I guess. Right, yeah. It's kind of all lost to time now, but the names live on. And so Slavdar the Merciless and Blundo the Blood Drinker formed a cooperative companionship which they used to survive for a long time, long enough to reproduce many, many times. They were so prolific, in fact, that future generations often can trace their lineage to them. Not because there was any genetic difference in their, you know, reproductive capacity, but because their cultural difference allowed them to not be constantly murdered. The end. And eventually the forest came back. The end. So survival of the fittest often gets talked about and thought about in terms of competition for resources and like, you know, who's the biggest, the strongest, the swiftest, the most able to win out in battles with other members of your own species or other species in competition for the scarce resources of the planet. But there's another approach that you can take when thinking about this or when thinking about how to find ways to survive together and be fit for the environment that you're in. And the main counterpoint to the idea that it's all this competition for resources is that by cooperating with one another, with other members of your own species or with other species, you can actually create situations that aid in the survival of and increase fitness for both species or both members of the species by working together rather than the sort of wasteful, destructive when you're competing for resources, you're kind of like directing all this energy towards knocking the other person down. It's kind of wasteful to compete with one another. You waste a lot of resources trying to get the other person out of your way in order to win the fight when you could both be mutually putting that energy towards doing something that's beneficial for everyone. Right. Yeah. I know it's stressful to fight. It puts wear and tear on an organism to be in this conflict mode. So if you can avoid conflict mode altogether, that could be a evolutionarily beneficial strategy. Not to mention that if, for example, you have some sort of war of lobster against lobster, where, you know, the bigger lobsters killing the smaller lobsters, then lobsters as an overall species is going to have less reproducing lobsters. And as a result, there's less lobsters in the end. That's not a beneficial strategy. So the most prominent and well-known articulation of this idea is the collection of essays by Kropotkin, Mutual Aid, a factor of evolution. And it kind of represents a larger school of thought. According to Stephen Jay Gould, at least, he says that there is a, a Russian intellectual movement that had this critique of Darwin's focus on the struggle for survival. And Kropotkin in the Americas is the best known example because his piece was translated into English, uh, whereas other similar arguments made by other Russian thinkers in that time weren't translated into English. But yeah, the basic idea that Kropotkin puts forward is that sociability and cooperation and mutual aid is just as much of a law of nature as a struggle for survival. And he gives tons of examples from nature. For example, he talks about crabs when they fall on their back in captivity, where all these crabs, they have nothing to gain from doing this uh, in a self-interested sense, but they see that another crab is on his back flailing wildly, and they all work together to flip their crab comrade back on its feet. He also talks about bees, how they work together, achieve something bigger than the sum of its parts. Wolves gather in packs, deer, elephants, bison, they move in groups to avoid being hunted working together to ensure their survival. You know, when you think about it, there's just like so many examples of animals that within a group all work together for the purposes of their survival. 
I think Kropotkin's real argument is just irrefutable that like this is a major factor in evolution. A species collaborating with itself for shared mutual survival is clearly a major factor in evolutionary selection when you look at nature. Yeah, one thing Bookchin says about evolution is that it might be better to think about the origin of species as an evolution of eco-communities, to think about the connections between species that evolve alongside one another rather than trying to think about how each species individually evolves. And I think that it's an important lens to look through because this idea of like individual species fighting it out against all others isn't how nature actually works. As you're saying, it's kind of like irrefutable that mutual interactions are a big part of nature. And there's so many examples. There's like human gut flora is necessary for us to be able to digest food. We have all these bacteria living inside our stomach, also on our skin. Like we couldn't exist without them. And th there's no species on this planet that could exist without another species. You, you could like pick whatever biggest, strongest, <laughs> fastest species you can think of, and then just imagine all other species disappearing, like all plants, all like it just, just all gone, no other life. Like nothing can survive on this planet alone. We need each other to live. That's what ecosystems are. Life lives in interaction with other life at all times. And when you're thinking about evolution of groups of species together, I think you can get a clearer picture of what's going on in nature than trying to think of evolution of individual species on their own. Yeah, because you think of the idea of like natural selection being this outside force that forces individuals within species or individual species to adapt to this thing that's like this force pushing in on them. It kind of obscures what's actually happening, which is like there's a variety of different environmental contexts that can change, uh, you know, including like weather, location. Uh, but most critically, the thing that changes is what other flora and fauna and microscopic organisms are in the environment that you're in. What plants and animals are in the area that you are? Are there predators? What are their expected relationships towards you? And what are the potentialities of sort of like animal-animal relationships there that exist in any given space? That context of being in sort of an eco-community, an evolutionary trajectory that involves, you know, all the species within a given area rather than each siloed individually, gives a fuller picture of like how evolution works. And I think is a really insightful aspect of Bookchin. It's funny, I was reading about the different types of interactions and symbiosis in nature more broadly is any types of like biological interactions between species that are kind of like habitual ongoing interactions. And they're sort of everywhere in nature, whether they're mutualistic ones or predatory ones or pollination or parasitism. And there's this idea of commensalism, which is relationships between species where one is benefit and the other is neither benefited nor harmed. And it's kind of a rare type because it's hard to prove in nature that there is no effect from one species on another. Most of the time, if you're existing Within, in relationship to another species, you affect each other. Like there's also one called neutralism, where it's like two species are in relationship, but interact, but do not affect each other. And it's kind of controversial and almost impossible to prove because like you can almost always find ways that any interactions end up having effects. <laughs> Such a weird idea just to think like these two animals interact, yeah. but they have no impact on each other whatsoever, either positive or negative. Yeah, it is It, it is a bit of a mind fuck, this idea of like true neutralism. But the example of commensalism that I saw is really funny. There, there's remoras are a type of fish also called sucker fish that kind of follow manatees around in the sea and eat their feces. So the idea is that the manatees are not affected by this at all, positively or negatively. And the sucker fish, it's obviously good for them. They've learned to eat the feces. <laughs> That's, That's a great example of fitness. Yeah. Humans would do well to learn from the, 
sucker fish. Find a source of food like that that's just doesn't bother anyone to utilize. And if by some wild coincidence, some contingency of history, these manatee shit eating sucker fish became the biggest brained, you know, most technologically and linguistically advanced species, and they conceived of this idea of natural selection, then they probably would endorse a teleological view that all species in nature are moving towards the <laughs> the righteous shit eating uh, that they only they were evolved enough to uh, achieve. Another cool version of symbiotic relationships, this one actually mutualistic, is that mycorrhiza, mycorrhiza is a Greek term for a mutual symbiotic association between fungus and plants. Something like 93% of plants are thought to have fungus literally in their cells. Where, where is this? It's 92% of plant families that have been studied and about 80% of species. It's so prevalent throughout the plant kingdom that fungus that live in the soil go into the plant's roots and help the plant absorb nutrients. That it's uh, the, In the words of evolutionary ecologist Alan Hare, what we call a plant isn't just a plant. It's usually a mosaic of plant and fungal tissues. So it's kind of similar to our bacteria that live inside of and around us that are part of us. Plants have similar relationships with fungus that help them absorb and digest nutrients from the environment around them. Another thing that I remember reading about is that when it comes to the cells that make up plants and animals, eukaryotes, they're called, you know, cells with nucleuses, one of the leading theories as to how these cells came to exist in the first place was that there was a merging of different bacteria. Uh, so it's like, I think the leading theory on where mitochondria comes from is that mitochondria is an adapted version of a bacteria that was swallowed by another bacteria, but not digested in a way that kind of fused and started reproducing together. Yeah, just another example of like a very fundamental unit of cooperation found in nature that like all plants and all animals are in this category, that these eukaryotic cells are made up of something that is thought to come from that sort of fusion, that sort of symbiosis. One way that they split up mutualistic relationships in biology is you can think of it as resource-resource relationships where resources are provided in both directions, like the plant roots of the fungi get carbohydrates from the plant, and the plant gets nutrients from the soil through the fungi. Uh, but then there's also service-resource relationships where like bees eat food from plants flying between different flowers, and then they also pollinate them. So the bees provide a service in exchange for a resource. And then there's also service-service relationships. I like that framework in thinking about the different ways that different species can interact. And I think you can also think about those things in terms of how different members of a species can interact, how we can help one another, providing resources and services to one another. Uh, and like, just thinking of those different categories really helped me, I guess, in a certain way, bridge that thing that's similar between all these different types of relationships. Because whether you're talking about two cells interacting, providing resources to one another, like spitting out things that the other cells like or whatever, um, or two humans doing that in, the, in a social environment where they're helping one another in some way, providing services to one another, it's different scales of the same type of thing, all these different ways of mutually benefiting one another, of being in symbiotic relationships where both sides win. Right. So it's like animals within a given species have cooperation tactics that can benefit all of their fitness by working together rather than competing with each other. And all animals, plant life, fungus, and bacteria evolve in a context that includes other forms of life, that it forms a variety of different types of relationships with based on context, and they mutually develop in relation to each other. And almost all animals, plants, and so on are themselves symbiotes that could not exist without, like, for example, humans, like half of our cells or something like that are bacteria. 
Um, and we are in a relationship with that bacterial Petri dish to be who we are. And it turns out that it doesn't just affect our digestion, it also affects our mental health. And we're finding out more about this stuff all the time. So in multiple ways, deep within the sort of what makes nature tick, there is cooperation as a means of not just survival, but a precondition of survival. Yeah, it really does feel like a key part of it. Like you can be as strong or smart or whatever individually as you want. And four or five other people, regardless of any of their qualities, are probably going to end up being better at you than everything if it's one by themselves versus five cooperating. Like there's power in not just numbers, but in numbers working together towards a common goal. And I think we can talk about things that set humans apart from other species, opposable thumbs, big brains, tool use, whatever. I think a big part of why we're so good at so many things is that we found really complex ways to cooperate with one another on large scales. There's no doubt that it's been like a powerful force in shaping who we are and what we're capable of. So yeah, I don't know. I'm convinced. It seems like the natural world is a place where, uh, despite competition of various kinds happening, it seems like maybe the dominant relationships are actually types of cooperation or relationality that aren't competitive. What do you think? I don't know if we've sat there and counted them all up yet of, you know, all the different relationships and are there more competitive ones or more cooperative ones, but just going off my gut, it feels like in general, cooperation is going to work out better than competition most of the time because of that conflict resource waste aspect of it where you're just like, I, I feel like it's inherently you're losing out on something when you're engaging in competition. Let me quote Kropotkin. Don't compete. Competition is always injurious to the species, and you have plenty of resources to avoid it. That is the tendency of nature, not always realized in full, but always present. Therefore, combine, practice mutual aid. That is the surest means for giving to each and all the greatest safety, the best guarantee of existence and progress, bodily, intellectual, and moral. That is what nature teaches us. Break up texts. Uh, Craig, what the hell is this mess? There's pistachio shells everywhere. Every single countertop, tabletop, shelf, even the mantle place. There's pistachio shells everywhere. Was this you? Oops, lol. Sorry, I must have forgot to pick them up. I guess you'll have to put them in the garbage before your mom visits tonight. My bad. P.S. We are out of ketchup. Can you get some? The fact that you remembered that my mother was coming tonight and you still left these pistachio shells everywhere is just, that's one too much. No, I won't buy you ketchup. Jeez, I can't believe you're getting mad at me for remembering that your mom's coming over tonight. You're always giving me shit for not remembering stuff like that. The reason I give you shit is because you do things that are inconsiderate. I'm just getting some mixed messages. I'm tired of playing this game where, you know, I'm always broken, I am always need to fix myself for you, and you never really apologized for the camping trip up at Boone Lake. I did apologize, and that was three years ago. And I didn't even do anything wrong on the camping trip. Right, classic. Didn't do anything wrong, but you did apologize. That really makes me feel heard and listened to. What a great apology. You're a natural. I feel heard, dancing emoji. I feel seen, eye emojis. You're a star. Why are you trying to turn this around on me and how good I'm apologizing right now for things I've already apologized before when I'm the one who is texting you about your habit of always leaving messes everywhere? Look, like Popeye said, I am what I am. I am a product of evolution. My ancestors were a little bit scatterbrained, left little messes around that conferred a survival advantage in my lineage. You know, your family history, evolutionarily, you know, they were more conscientious and shrewd when it came to the aesthetic management of their domiciles, you know? It's just the biological difference in our histories. And, you know, I'm tired of being penalized and attacked for being thoughtless when thoughtlessness is what got me and my people this far. Oh, not this again. You're always trying to push the buck off onto your evolutionary history. 
Oh, evolutionary history makes me more messy. Oh, evolutionary history means I can't send a simple text message when I'm going to be home late. My evolutionary history means that I want to open up the relationship. No, that's not how evolution works. Not every single individual little trait you have was selected for by your entire evolutionary history. Sometimes evolution just selects for the ability to have a wide range of variation within a certain number of traits. And, and even if that wasn't true, even if all our traits were from evolution, that doesn't mean they were directly selected for. They could have been side effects of things that were selected for, or they could have been things that were selected for at one time and were beneficial, but now just aren't not being selected for anymore. Look, humans are highly adaptable, and I'm asking you to adapt to this relationship. There he goes again, trying to upstage me in my own field of passion, evolution. You know what? I think your ancestors were probably evolved to be so cruel to the people around you. I don't know why it was selected for. Probably some weird sociopathic manipulating people to reproduce more kind of stuff. That's going on in your history. I, I can just see this clear as day. You know what? I think maybe you need to evolve a bit emotionally. Maybe instead of me adapting to this relationship, you can adapt to being alone. Just answer me one question. Did evolution select for you to be an enormous, condescending prick? Oh, sorry. Did evolution select you to be a whiny crybaby victim that doesn't know how to speak directly about things? No, that's not how evolution works. Yes, it is. You know what? You've misstated the science one too many times. I could handle pistachio shells, but this is just too much. It's over. Don't bother coming home after work. I'm changing the locks. Fine. Tell your mom what you did on the camping trip and see what she says. And so, rather than have an honest reckoning with their persistent bad habits of insincere apologies and ascribing every personal habit and political position to evolutionary history, miscommunication piled upon miscommunication, and our star-crossed lovers had to end things. And these were the breakup texts. We now go to two friends on a camping trip, after one of them just had a rough breakup. And yeah, so that was the final straw. You know, it wasn't even the pistachio shells, it was that teleological view of evolution, just projecting it into everything all the time, won't take responsibility. Like, I was evolved to do that. My ancestors loved to leave their pistachio shells all over the place. Oh, God. I'm sorry. I'm ranting. I don't want to make this all about me, but... Stephen Jay Gould critiques that exact thing in this Spandrels essay. I tried linking to that I don't know how many times. And he said he read it, but it was like it didn't sink in at yeah, all. Yeah, that sucks. The thoughtlessness and then just trying to write it off on like some sort of biological determinism and shit. That would really get under my skin, too. Thank you. You understand. You know, just like assuming that everything has evolved for some... Like you see sociopaths in the world. And then you're like, oh, these sociopaths must have been selected for at some point in evolution. There must be some evolutionary advantage of sociopathy. I see people saying shit like this. Yeah, it's the like, teleological trajectory of history moves towards having sociopaths. It just makes sense to me that sociopathy, for example, could arise in our brains are really complex. So you have variation within that in a population, not just from mutation, but from like sexual reproduction, the recombining of genetic material and stuff. Sometimes things Things don't line up exactly the same way on some brain system or whatever and it results in something like sociopathy and then humanity doesn't entirely select against it so it exists in a very small proportion of the population that's not evolving to be sociopaths yeah it could even be that it's not a genetic thing like we don't even know fully what causes sociopathy not everything just comes straight from genes like that yeah things can be cultural too or product of experience but yeah, there's so many weird myths out there about evolution. I feel like sometimes the language we use around this stuff just really gets in the way. We're talking about survival of the fittest when it's not even really talking about just survival, it's reproduction, and fittest doesn't mean like physically fit. Depending on what environment you're in, what could make you fit for that environment could be such a huge variety of things. Yeah, and survival of the fittest almost sounds like it's getting ever fittest, like with each generation fitter than the last. So it implies that teleology of moving towards higher and higher forms of evolution. It's not the case that there's any specific trajectory of evolution which is predictable and destined or anything like that. 
there's like a huge amount of contingency within it. For example, if there's no asteroid to take out the dinosaurs, it's unlikely that the little mammals of the day would grow into being larger, erect apes with big brains like us. Without that asteroid, it may have never been fit to evolve into humans. Yeah, and does that mean that dinosaurs are just more fit than us and we're just lucky? Or maybe the asteroid would have taken us out too, but... They were fitter for their environment than we would be fit for their environment at this point. Yeah, no, definitely. But also vice versa. You drop some dinosaurs in the modern world and we could probably take them out. You know, and I've sometimes heard different versions, like sometimes people try to turn it on their head and say like, oh, it's survival of the friendliest. And Yeah, I think there's a book out with that title. Right. It makes a lot of sense that, you know, cooperating, social bonds, people coming together and helping one another survive is going to help people survive, right? Like if you're not constantly fighting with everyone within your group, you're friendly to one another going to be able to survive more. That makes sense to me. But even then, I don't know if it's fully only true all the time. I've seen some really friendly people get kind of crushed down in various situations. So I don't know if it's always just the friendliest who survive, but I think it's a good strategy. Yeah. Survival of the friendliest is a good inversion to talk about the social and mutual aid histories of evolution, especially specific species like humans. But it doesn't encompass, like, survival of the fittest aspires to be like, a law of nature that produces outcomes in this different way. So, like, I don't think survival of the friendliest works as that either. Natural selection kind of does, but I think my big issue with the wording natural selection is that natural sounds almost like it's saying normatively good. I feel like natural has a synonym meaning with natural and good versus of the natural world. So I could keep selection, but sub out natural for something else yeah maybe like environmental selection or yeah i don't know i know what you mean though it kind of invokes the naturalistic fallacy to even have that word in there natural i was thinking maybe survival of the adaptive but maybe something like adaptive selection there's selection for adaptation but there's multiple levels of adaptation right there's adaptation across generations like mutations that are pushed and pulled by environmental factors on one level. And then you also have selection for the ability to be adaptive. It's like having more potentiality, more potential to adapt to different things as like a species. If you have only one survival strategy as a species, right. that means if that survival strategy runs out, then you're fucked. But being adaptive would mean that you have a spectrum of survival strategies. I think we can also say capacity for adaptation on an individual level is another one of those things that's just going to be sort of naturally, mathematically, against the tide of randomness is going to be selected for. So yeah, I don't know, maybe adaptive selection might. Yeah, or maybe survival of the most adaptive or, yeah. And I think too, sometimes it's not even just a change within your species that could be a survival strategy. I was reading about where the way that certain types of plants have been able to fight off lethal funguses that are introduced to environments is because they've already formed symbiotic relationships with other types of funguses. So that's not genes changing. That's not even changing how they do anything. It's just a sort of, those plants almost just got lucky. You know, the lucky plants infected with the right fungus were able to fight off the other one. survival of the, the fortunate. Right. And they also formed a little friendship. Back to friendliest again. Yeah. Yeah, or maybe even like survival of the complementary. I mean, generally speaking, in order for creatures to persist across generations, they need to find an environmental niche within a collection of all these different animals, plants, and funguses that all relate to each other. So survival of the complementary might work. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because ecosystems are these balances of different interacting species and those that can find a way to exist in a complementary state in nature are going to be the ones that are sort of existing over time. Uh, or if you're like humans and you end up destroying the biosphere with too much carbon emissions or whatever, that's not very complementary and so that lessens chances of survival. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah, I mean, of course, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And by changing the names of things, you can't change the things themselves. But I feel like diversifying the language that we use to talk around this topic might help to make the rich, integrated, beautiful thing that is natural selection more intuitive for what it really is, instead of the nonsense that your ex is talking about, you know, like they listen to the wrong podcast, all of a sudden they're like, oh, there's a gene in our brain that makes us want to open the relationship. <laughs> Call back to last summer. 
He literally yeah. said that, right? Gene in the brain? Gene in the brain, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this guy's an expert. You know, he has other good qualities. Now I'm just embarrassed to even have been with him for so long, but... No, sorry, I don't mean to like shit on him entirely, but just the gene in the brain thing is... No, I, I'm with you. You would think this guy's brain is just a collection of genes for negative, annoying behaviors, the way he describes it. The messiness gene, the cheating on people gene... Never letting anything from three years ago on his completely different camping trip go, Gene. He never said that one, but I'm sure he would. I May mean, I do an impression of him? Resentment is like adaptive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's so on the nose. Yeah. Thanks for coming on this camping trip with me. Anyways. Oh, anytime. These trees, it's incredible. Like just getting out. Like you just feel totally different after a day out just surrounded by trees with none Absolutely, of the, the yeah. crap. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, I wouldn't want to be here all the time, but it, it's a whole vibe. I'd want to bring more of this into the cities, kind of get rid of all the roads, replace it with trees and stuff, but I wouldn't want to be camping all the time for sure. Yeah, and I guess these, like, forests are decreasing in availability and size around the world over time, right? Maybe not camping sites specifically, but, you know, it's precious. It feels good for the mental. Yeah, it's proven, yeah. There's a gene in our brain that makes it that way. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Uh, there's a gene in my brain that makes me like the forest. I mean, that might be sort of true in a way, like deep enough in our evolutionary history when we were like little mammals. We lived in forests all the time. I don't know if there's something that's like a memory that's passed on. There's probably ways that were adapted to forests in various ways, but I don't think that's the same thing as, oh, you're a person who doesn't like going camping, and I do. So that means we have two different genes. Yeah, that, you evolved yeah. on the plains. I evolved in the trees. Yeah, no, nah. Probably not. We now go to a recently broken up guy who just got back from camping, visiting his dying dad in his deathbed. Uh, dad? Hey, hey. I'm... You're here. Yeah. Yeah, sorry I uh, haven't been for a couple days. I just had to get away. Yeah, where were you? Well, uh, you know, me and Craig broke up. Oh, I'm yeah. so sorry. How are you going to get me my grandkids? Well, I mean, we couldn't have... We're going to have to do surrogacy or adopt anyway. Right. because surrogacy uh, with your seed. Our seed. See, the I, family seed. Well, either way, I don't know. It's the oh, furthest please. thing from my mind at the moment. But next the time, seed. please. I mean, I'm dying. Yeah, you're dying. It's a dying wish. Oh, you can't, you can't do that to me, yes, dying I can. wish. How many do I get? That's my first, first one. No, I'm saying you can't do any. I feel like it's unfair oh, to so do that Oh, so you're going to turn all. down your dead dad's dying wish. No, I'm telling you to, before you die, retract the wish so that you're not putting me in this unfair position. I'm dying. I'm wishing. Can't do much about that. God, you're so manipulative, Dad. I'm giving you an honest accounting of what I'm wishing as I die. I would just hope that you would wish that I would do what I want to do. You and... need to pass on the family genes. What? It doesn't... Our family genes are already passed on. That's we what have Darwin cousins. meant when we he have... said fitness. Sure, and kin selection is part of Darwinian fitness, right? Selecting for your kin. So I help take care of Sally's kids. It's our second cousin that's helping pass on the family genes, you know? Oh, barely. You got so much more of these sweet genes than those those little rascals. I, I mean, love who... them, and I hope they survive and pass on many for more fruitful generations. But you, I mean, you're my boy. You're my oldest son. Right, and I only have half of your genes right now. And if I had a kid, they would only have a quarter of your genes. No, these are strong like, genes. I, I guess. Sometimes I they push out. Actually, you get more than half, and that's what we're dealing with. I'm not actually sure how genetic things work like that, but maybe. that's It's a I war of all against all down there, and our genes win. Well, if our genes are so great and so strong, then it really doesn't matter, right, if I pass it. Because they're everywhere, right? The deck is being oh. shuffled and reshuffled through oh, the generations. I can and feel myself dying slightly. Oh, I got a wish coming on. What is this wish? I'm wishing. Oh, I'm wishing that my genes were passed on so our family might survive and my oldest son would do that. Well, and... I'm wishing that you understood we're not, but you're not just dying. our genes. I don't, who who and cares if you what you wish? Can I just tell you what I wish? Fine. You're always like this. It's a living wish of a young man. Yeah, it's my final wish before you die to have you it's understand. A totally this. different caliber of wish. Insulting, frankly, here as I die. 
Hit me with it. What's the wish? Well, it's two wishes. First, my wish is that you would support me in anything I do, whether I chose to have a hundred kids or live a child-free lifestyle. Oh. But my second wish is that you understood that I don't identify with your genes or my genes or even the family's genes. I identify with humanity. And what I want to do with my oh, life cringe. is help humanity continue on into the future so that's why i'm trying to do what i can to fight climate change to fight income inequality to fight environmental destruction and social political structures that hurt people and lessen our chances of continuing on as a species that's what i'm focused on i think i can have a bigger effect on the future of humanity by thinking about how we organize ourselves socially than i can by specifically worrying about your genes being 25% of some child that I hypothetically have. Okay, I've got a second dying wish. Haven't you already made two? Uh, whatever, yeah, what is it? Robert, this is, I mean, I'm trying to give you an out. Okay, I'm listening. I wish that before I die, you drive me to the sperm bank and you and I both make donations. And you continue to make donations after I pass in my memory. Well, I don't... Then I don't, you do whatever you want in your personal time. The doctors have already said you're not leaving this room again, so I don't think we can get you to the sperm bank. Uh, but of the various dying wishes... Thermos. That is the least objectionable. I feel like it wouldn't be too hard. No, you're going to have to donate this in your name. Uh, I wonder if I'm going to have to fill out a whole thing. Like, don't they have, like, a book and then they can, like, pick based on, like, stats and stuff? So, uh, the whole yeah. thing, I don't know. Like, okay, it's, it's good. Uh, I'm glad it exists. Like, you know, fertility helping one another. It's say good, it's but... you. Get it. Take it out of the thermos. I mean, I'm dying. I can't even go down there to do it myself. No, yeah, no, I know. They're saying, really, it's probably minutes, less than a minute, maybe. Right, then. I'm going to have to get this done quick. Is that really how you want to spend our last moments together? <laughs> <sighs> oh, maybe you're right. Maybe I couldn't get it done in time. Oh, look, the machines are just beeping. They're going wild. I feel like the moment's approaching. Do you? Uh, this is your last chance to release me from the unfair wishes. Do you want to release me? Uh, no. Not at all. I feel a wish coming on. One no, final please, defining no. wish. No, please stop. I wish that my son would use 10% of his inheritance to further the development of our genetic material in the future generations. That's... And go to the sperm bank and have a kid. You want me to spend 10% of my inheritance? Yes. N no, what does that even mean? I'm not doing that. It's for that. you to determine. I just want you to know before you die, I'm not doing that. Wow, what a horrible thing to say to a dying man. Are you ready to take that back before your old man dies? No, are you ready to take back the wish before you no. lose your son? I wish every what? part of that, sincerely. Well, then I guess we're just going to... You're going to be a guy who ignored his dad's dying wish. I'm going to be a dad who... Uh, You're going to be a dad, you admit it? No, I just stumbled over my words. I meant That's to say... like you were admitting it. I might be a dad, but I might adopt, yes. and I might not have your genes Ooh. at all. Ooh, yes to the first part. I'm dying. You know, I never wanted to say this, but I'm sitting here good. wishing. I just need these wishes to stop, honestly. You rejected your dad's dying wish. I can feel it now, the death coming over me. Ugh. We now go to two paramedics picking up an injured bicyclist from the scene of a hit and run. All right, stay calm, stay calm, everyone. The paramedics are here. Please just give us a bit of space. Yeah, a little bit of space. There he is. Hey, there's our guy. How yeah, you don't, doing? don't try to get up. <laughs> just kidding. It doesn't look like you're... Yeah, I don't think... He's, <laughs> that's pretty funny, actually, considering how mangled. Looks like the strong really took out the weak in this one. I mean, cars are inherently stronger than human bodies. Let's lift you up onto the... Uh... Stretcher there, yeah. yeah. Hey... That's nature for you, though. Yeah, if you had had a random genetic mutation that made your bones not break, then you would have survived this as a measure of your fitness in this environment. But unfortunately, that's not the case. You also don't seem to have the gene that would prevent the bones from sticking through the skin, which could have been evolved by now, but hasn't been. Let's just hope your blood clotting genes have kept enough blood inside you until we can get saline drips and maybe 
some donated blood. We'll see, but... Yeah, we're going to take you to a couple of doctors that got really great genes in their brain to be doctors. It's going to be touch and go here for a while. You got about a 50-50 shot right now, so if you do die, just remember it's because you're weak. Right, and it's, it's not a personal attack, but in terms of fitness... You might have just showed your ass tonight, but sorry, we're being rude. We're being so rude. Um, yeah. My name is Chris. This is Michael. And if you die, it's natural. Yeah, sometimes we forget, you know, it's the worst day of people's lives when we see them. But for us, it's just another day. Yeah, thank goodness you're wearing the helmet, though, huh? <laughs> Should have got some helmets here, 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 and here. If you had a, little, a few more helmets, yeah, if you'd evolved it'd be a whole different scene. The capacity to know that you need to wear multiple body helmets in different parts of your body right now, you'd be in much better shape. We always disagree about this. I don't think there is a gene for knowing to wear helmets on your body. I think that's just a cultural thing. And I think that the way that we respond to cultural things is based on our genes. Well, to some degree, but not that degree. Yes, every degree. (laughs) He is incorrigible. But it does raise the question of whether our jobs even should exist. Like, maybe we should be letting people naturally hit by cars like this. Maybe by now we would have evolved the knowledge to wear helmets on different parts of the body by now. Or even or these just developed bones. an exoskeleton, yeah. Or strong inside bones, yeah. There's strong bones either stuff. inside or outside. This is always the eternal debate among us paramedics. Is the paramedic profession the epitome of a sort of cultural evolution towards greater survival for the whole of humanity? Or are we an impediment to the natural rough and tumble evolution that would be giving us stronger bones or exoskeletons, inside bones, knowing to wear helmets? We're always fighting this stuff out. You ever, if you ever see a paramedic driving by, I can give you, I put $10 on the table. They're debating about that at that exact time. Yeah, you non-paramedics probably wouldn't get it, but yeah, it's, it's just uh, who we are. It's just how we think. And there's the hospital. Do you want to get up and walk in? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Yeah, a little bit of paramedic humor there. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure the knee's supposed to bend that way. <laughs> you could try walking, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, we'd advise against it. But if you did and you died from it, that would be natural. No, no, we'll cooperate with you. Here, uh, we'll just, uh, here we go. Yeah, lift it up. And, uh, uh, yeah. All right, well, best of luck with your healing journey. Uh, or if not, thank you for your service. Me? No, no, sorry, the the bicycle accident. Yeah, I thought dying you man. were looking at them, but then I just was like, they're not serving it, so, yeah, anyway. Right, I meant they were, like, sort of serving, I don't know, maybe this is out there, but I felt like they were serving and being a failed experiment. Right, that right. They went out there, they expressed those exact genes, they didn't work out, it's for the best that we go our separate ways. It was a good try, and, like, that's why I meant thanks for your service. Yeah, it's kind of nice, that's a nice way to think about it. I like that. Oh, oh, my beeper's going off. Yeah, we're going to... child we, got bit by an alligator. Ooh, those genes are looking like they might have been selected against. If the child had evolved a proper fear of alligators or an exoskeleton, we'd be in a totally different situation. Yeah, totally. All right, let's go pick up this kid. All right, see you later. Mangled bicycle victim. All sorts of weird shit in nature fits survivally. Head lice is adapted to the environment of sucking blood on the heads of hairy mammals. And the head lice is never going to evolve computers and big brains and stuff because it has no need to. Its environment is perfectly suited for... It's going to get better and better at sucking blood through the scalps (laughs) of the children at daycare. Yeah, or maybe it's just good enough at sucking blood at this point. Right, yeah, no, there's stuff that just stays the same for super, super long periods of time. It's just a really solid strategy. A nice big old one, crocodiles. Crocodiles and alligators, old ass strategy. That's a long term strategy. They've just been pretty much alligators and crocodiles the whole time. They change in size, spiky teeth, dinosaur things that live in submerged water. Shit works. Yeah, so there's not just one way to be fit. Lice are really fit. So are humans. We're pretty fit. There's different evolutionary niches that we can fit into. There isn't a single teleological fitness that evolution as a whole strives towards. It's not that lice are just underdeveloped humans on the way to becoming like us on the great evolutionary 
step forward. There's just different ways to be fit. And one of the major ways that humans have landed on in terms of fitness is having more of an ability to adapt socially to different environments. Yeah, and it's just a metaphor. Like survival of the fittest is just a metaphor. It's a way of framing this iterative long-term process with all these tiny little changes where there's diversification and then there's natural selection. And there's also random environmental factors. And then there's social selection within species. Boiling all that down to survival of the fittest, clearly from the way it's used in practice, the vision of the natural world that evolution gives us has elements of it that are inhumane and alien to us in weird ways. But describing the natural world in terms of this cruel, amoral, self-interested process is just factually wrong. And if that's the common sense that people are getting about evolution and Darwinism, then that needs to be corrected. Yeah, there's nothing about nature that says the winning strategies in every situation have to do with being cruel and competing against one another. Like a really good evolutionary strategy might be to help as many people survive as possible for as long as possible, to increase the diversity within the species so that if any major keyhole events in the future happen where there's some massive change to the environment, the more diversity you have within the species, the more chance you have of some of you being able to adapt to the new circumstances. In my opinion, for humanity, how we survive the next couple hundred years, thousand years, is we should really like lean into our strengths, use our social ability and complex social structures to create big networks of helping one another, and to also really lean into our big brains by investing heavily in the most advanced education that's possible to be given on every level. Like, How do you make the most education-oriented society possible? That is an evolutionary strategy that I think will benefit humanity very well. Not that I typically think about things an evolutionary strategy. I'm not like just sitting around being like, how can humans increase their evolutionary fitness? That's not what I'm usually thinking about. But come to think of it, going like heavy 110% into being an education-oriented society, it would lean into our existing adaptability and sociality for maximum survival benefits in the future, no matter how the context changes. That's a good point. Yeah. So even if your goal was some weird meta strategizing about Darwinian fitness, it's still the wrong idea to therefore take some generations old hierarchical ideas about who's better than other people and call that fitness and then try to design society in such a way so that anyone who doesn't meet your racist, ableist, misanthropic standards doesn't get to reproduce. So I also don't think of things in terms of evolutionary strategy, but yeah, just interesting to note that even if you did, the people who claim to think about things in that term still aren't really doing it right. seems like they're just more concerned with the racism and ableism and all that. You know, in the Dr. Seuss story, The Sneetches, right, if classic. you recall correctly, there's the star bellies and then the non-star bellies. And at one point, the non-star bellies got star bellies. And everyone had star bellies, which is how their hierarchy was set up. I'm just using this as an example, but there's this pinpoint moment here that just, I always think about since doing my <laughs> review of the Sneetches. The Sneetches with stars, when everyone got stars on stars, they said, oh, let's get a machine that can remove our stars and we'll make not having the stars the new thing we can use to attack other people. I'm like, what, what, what's going on there? And the Sneetches heads, why did they want so badly to retain their position? over the other sneeches, you know? It goes by without comment in the Dr. Seuss story. Something twisted went on in their minds at that moment. That's the ideology of, like, hierarchy. That's the idea of hierarchy that's really toxic. Anyway, so like the star-bellied sneeches, the rich and powerful found things within Darwinist theory that they managed to massage into their pre-existing horrific ideas, and they took those ideas to their horrifying conclusions the final solution document that the Nazis wrote includes the words natural selection in it at one point. It's not Darwin's fault that this ideology has been taken so far in this horrific direction at points. But the legacy of these really hierarchical interpretations of survival of the fittest is severe enough that I think we should really be on guard for the way that it can slip into the way that people talk and think about the world. I think it is really deeply rooted in ableism and that also connects it to fascism. Yeah, the sort of veneration of strength. Because they misinterpret what fitness means, right? It suits the vision of 
the strong ruling over the weak and stuff, which is like a typical fascist vision. Yeah, it's what they dream about at night. And that exterminationist logic of getting rid of part of us is, as we were saying, not a good evolutionary strategy. Like if the tautological statement is that survival of the fittest means the survival of those who survive, then any social institutions we create that increase survival rather than reducing it, like exterminationist, eugenics-based ideologies would have you go for, is increasing the fitness of the species. One way that species struggle for survival out in the wild world is by trying to reproduce quickly in big numbers. So it decreases the chances of them being eradicated. That's right. what allows them to proliferate. Humans invest more time into their young than a lot of species. Little baby humans take longer to become self-sufficient than most animals. So in terms of evolutionary fitness, we're doing about as good as we can do on the genetic front. We're adapted to live on Earth, in space, on other planets, without changing our biology. Like We're in a position to really we could live under sea if we wanted. The world is our oyster in terms of our design, our body plan, what we've inherited from our ancestors, our big brains and stuff. Yeah, and like, some of us do want to live under the sea. Just saying. I think we should have room for that. We should respect that. I don't think people should be bullied or taunted for that sort of <laughs> desire. I'm just saying I agree with you. It's possible for us, and the only thing limiting that is our social relations currently. Exactly. So just in terms of like evolutionary fitness of humans, my point is don't worry about it. Focus on the survival and fitness is taken care of. We're an incredibly fit for existence species. One of our big issues is that we're a little too fit and our fitness is failing when it comes to living in balance and complementarity with the world. You know, like we're taking more than is owed to us. So we're focusing on short term survival at the risk of long term survival. But we get next day delivery and that's the trade off. Right. Yeah. It's almost like the strategy of taking as much as you can for yourself and assuming that there will be enough out in nature forever works for a while. But then once there's enough people or enough ability of the people to harness natural resources, the environment changes at that point And it's no longer a good strategy to extract as much from nature as you can and assume that there will always be more. Yeah, I think looking for a law of nature to make an axiomatic statement that also describes the way we relate to each other in social life, survival of the fittest is probably a bad version of that, to assume it's both a law of nature and how we should treat each other in the social realm. It's a particularly bad one. I think if we want to project something like that onto nature that we want to take into our social life, I think we should project something good and like... Nature is nice. It's mostly nice if you think about it. Like, sure, they kill each other and stuff. They eat each <laughs> other. But uh, some stuff's poison. But overall, making your leaves poison is just setting healthy boundaries with the world around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're going to have a guiding mythos that you project onto nature, I don't know if you should ever have one of those that you believe so thoroughly that nothing could shake you from it, but... It should at least serve you in the moment. It should be a useful survival of the fittest. It has too many weird implications. Yeah, I think when it comes to our evolution, I think the golden rule cuts a lot closer to what's actually helped us out. Yeah. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Survival of the most golden. Mm -hmm. Not to rank metals and say that gold is better than the other metals. I mean, that's arbitrary, but... Maybe thriving of the most complementary is how to describe nature. Kind of the social ecological view. So yeah, when people are like talking about jobs they're getting or talking about the business world, they're like, you know what they say, it's the thriving of the most complimentary out here. You got to find your niche. You got to get your synergy. You got to find your partnerships. Look, you're a businessman. I'm a businessman. Let's find some way to thrive in a complimentary way. In the anti-capitalist business of the future. Or were you trying to pervert the... the I was thinking of perverted it. You wrinkled my brain there. I was like, anti-capitalist business. <laughs> I thought you were saying that genuinely as a businessman in a different society where we just still call it business when people do things, but it's like, I'm going out and doing business with others and how do we all thrive together? And It's good for if people get scared when you're like, we want to rebuild society into a confederated commune of communes where people are paid according to need that's directly democratic and ecological. People are given an irreducible minimum. We live in complementarity with the environment and each other. And we use usufructi and property relations. And they're, they're just like, ah, that scares me. Yeah, exactly. They're like, oh my God, what's going to happen to business? Then you're like, 
Don't worry. There's still something called business. It's a little different, but you'll recognize it. And then you turn around to your leftist friends and are like, don't worry. It's more just like kind of we like got a, some business to take care of. It doesn't mean like we're just keeping the, keeping the suitcase. Oh, are you up in our business as an organization, a mutual aid organization? It's more like funny business, but serious for a serious ends. It's still something that people go out and do every day. It's just no longer compulsive and it no longer works by the same underlying systems of relation. If you think about it, we all have our own business already. Right. It's kind of like, that's their business. That's their business. And we're Whose not going to totally get what? rid of office buildings. There's going to still be something like office buildings in some way. And people might go and do what their future business is there in the future, holding a suitcase. Yeah. And while they're there, they might say to one another as a bit of common sense. I'm a businessman. Th- oh. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> the thriving of the most complimentary. It's just how we think about things. One businessman to another. That's the thriving of the most complimentary. You got to get your symbiotic. Yeah, I'm so glad our mutual aid factory can supply your school with the textbooks it needs. Thriving of the most complimentary. And then the person who is scared by the utopian vision of an alternative future, they're going to say, "Ah, I see myself in this world. I see myself in this world as a businessman. (laughs) I'm no longer afraid of this reorganization. Yeah, they'll renounce their class interests and... (laughs) join the vision yeah i mean so few people are being around like what are my class interests today (laughs) (laughs) that's how i think about everything that's why we gotta trick them i say we engage them so thoroughly it's as if we never tricked them at all hey kids hi hi children settle down now we are here from the ninas group and we are here today to refute the idea of survival of the fittest and share a positive idea of natural history and humanity's place in it. Does that sound good, kids? Yay! Yeah, yeah. Really happy. Good vibes. We want to teach you kids the basic philosophy of our utopian society, how we think about things, how some people thought about things in the past, like survival of the fittest. It's, you know, there's a sense in which it could still be true, but the things that people projected into it and like fitness being this sort of individualistic trait rather than something that could exist in cooperation between species, cooperation between people that... The way that we survive best is by surviving together and helping one another out. That makes us all more fit. The fact of the matter is, kids, that we became the species that we are today through cooperative survival strategies, engaging in complex social organization. Like That is our survival strategy against the backdrop of nature. If we're going to be making a general sort of rule of nature and then applying it to human social relations, survival of the fittest is totally inappropriate. To quote Kropotkin kids, sociability is as much a law of nature as mutual struggle. Nailed it, Kropotkin. I mean, just look at this classroom, kids. Would we be able to give this presentation to you if we were competing with one another, sabotaging each other so that we could say the ideas first or like trying to trip the other one up? It would be confusing for you, kids. Now, this is working better because we're cooperating with one another. And that principle applies on all the way down from person-to-person interactions, to -to species-to-species interactions, to types of cells exchanging resources with one another, to the ways animals work together with others of their species to help each other, almost universally. You know, animals travel in packs, herds, families, various groups of various kinds. And kids, humans really are uniquely peaceful animals. You know, Stephen Jay Gould points out that wild animals are watched in captivity. A nonviolent species would be a species that's violent every like 60 hours or so. But when it comes to people, you could watch them for weeks and weeks without seeing any sort of incidents of violence. So even if nature did tend to be violent overall, there's good evidence to suggest that humans are in discontinuity with that aspect of the natural world. Yeah, if you ask me, just we've found better ways to do things. Maybe that's just the human in me, but I personally love cooperating, over fighting. Children, imagine fighting red and tooth and claw in a war of all against all. Does that sound fun to you? No, that's right. It isn't fun. And wouldn't you rather be playing with your friends? The wisdom of children. These kids are smart. Frankly, it's just right, you know, playing with your friends is a larger factor in human evolution than being red in tooth and claw. 
Yeah, and while there's no inherent tie between what is a bigger part of nature and what we as human society should do, I think if we are going to look out into nature for principles that we want to extract and turn into ethical principles that we apply to society, that principle of cooperation, of play, of mutual gain for both participants and an interaction, uh, it's a really good one to pick. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, we agree with Stephen Jay Gould that the natural world has existed way longer than humans ever did. So it makes no sense that the natural world would contain the answers to the specifics of human questions. But at the same time, we also think that Murray Bookchin is right, that the way we view our position in the natural world is deeply entangled with the way that our social world is organized. I mean, every society projects itself onto nature. Right, yeah, and, and Bookchin says that we should see nature as, to quote him, a diversity that nurtures freedom, an interactivity that enhances complementarity, and a wholeness that fosters creativity, and a growing subjectivity that yields greater rationality. The basic idea is that in nature, community strengthens individuality because life evolves in niches in relationality to one another in an eco-community. So the diversity of nature nurtures freedom because as you get a more divergent biome, there's more opportunities for members of species in a diverse ecosystem to pursue different survival strategies. And in that sense, evolution has a participatory nature. Yeah, because evolutionarily we are shaped by our environment, but our environment is also shaped by our choices. Our environment includes our political environment. Our environment includes uh, the rules of our society, how we've set things up, our economic systems. So the choices that people make on how to live end up shaping who we are on a very deep level. Right, and, and those political choices and ethical choices that we face as humans in the modern day, applies back through our evolutionary history on a kind of gradient. There was origins to the conscious participation in the environment that had steps along the way that were increasing degrees of freedom. Because the choices being made by living creatures based on the opportunities they're presented by diversity includes the opportunity to form symbiotic relationships. So in that sense, symbiotic evolution is shaped by the freedom which is afforded by diversity. Yeah, there's a sense in which we could say that not only did humans evolve in groups, but humans chose to evolve in groups. That's right. I mean, with the complexity of human cognition, it was an active choice over generations and generations. It wasn't that we were like programmed robotically to live in groups and cooperate. It's that time and time again, we chose and rechose doing that. Uh, any questions? Uh, yeah, I was wondering what you all think of the evolutionary theory of human self-domestication. Oh, you're referring to the idea that as animals become more domesticated, they have extended periods of childhood, more childlike features into adulthood, and that humans have also followed a similar path, but may, perhaps that we've done this to ourselves. No, a lot of people think that's true. And in fact, in science.org in December of 2019, there's an article called Early Humans Domesticated Themselves. New genetic evidence suggests selection against bullies may have caused significant changes in the way our species looks. So, so it's an interesting theory. By the way, kid, do you want me to text this to you the, so you can read the whole article? Why not just post it in the whole class's group chat so everyone can read? Oh, that's a great idea. Oh, that's, that's good. Uh, any other questions? So, like, are you saying that nature itself is egalitarian and that we need to live in sync with nature? Uh, no, no, I'm not saying that. No, we're, no, we're, no, we're no. not saying that. Egalitarianism is a institutionalized social relation. There are no institutionalized social relations in nature except for the ones created by human beings. So neither hierarchical social relations nor egalitarianism really exists in nature. But we can say that nature is non-hierarchical in that nature isn't organized as an institutionalized hierarchy. Like, for example, you can't rank a platypus and a lion and say that one is above each other in some sort of ranking of nature. It's not how the world works. They're part of complex, interconnected webs of life. Yeah, there's many different types of biological interactions. There's predation, there's mutualisms, there's commensalisms, there's parasitism. So egalitarianism is part of what we choose to 
take out of nature to apply to society. The animals that make up our evolutionary history and that make up the world today aren't just passive objects that are subjected to external forces. They're also agents in themselves, and increasingly so over time as complexity and differentiation grows. And the sum of their choices impacts evolution over the long term as much as other forces. It's what made humans who we are today. Freedom and participation and mutual care are things that we can find in nature uh, that can be made even more profound through the conscious incorporation into social human communities and can be institutionalized by humans because that's ultimately what distinguishes human society from the non-human community is our complex social institutions. Uh, what is in that giant box over there on the side of the room? It says warning canine on the side. Oh, that's just a little surprise, a little, that's a secret uh, for later. Oh, heck, why, why not? You know, since you asked about it, let's open it up. It's puppies, kids, puppies. Yeah. These Woo-hoo. cute little puppies. They... It's puppies. It's puppies. Now grab one to pet, kids. Oh, look at that big tongue just licking and the kids are laughing. What a cute thing to see. Dogs that are children, along with humans that are children, playing together. This is just lovely. Yeah, I know you kids probably don't understand it this way, but when I look at you, I see the puppy of humans. Yeah, similar features. You know, puppies have bigger eyes than adult dogs uh, in relation to their head. Neotony, I think, is the name for it. You know, more childlike. You know, even as adults, uh, domesticated dogs and humans, they retain neotonic features as well. Compare a dog to a wolf, an adult, you'll see the difference. You know, I gotta say, this has gotta be probably number two or three in terms of most cute ever days at story time i would say this is in running for the absolute cutest i think you might be maybe it's just my innately social nature talking but i think you might be right this actually might be literally the cutest thing that i ever did see i think so you know some people say we shouldn't rank cuteness but this is the cutest Oh, yeah, and I wouldn't want to rank the children by cuteness or something like that, but to no, as, no, no, as no, an event. event. Yeah. yeah, different type of ranking altogether. These nuances are second nature to us in this society. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, so uh, that's the end of the episode. It's been fit here surviving with you, Aaron. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's been fit surviving with you as well. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, if you want to help this podcast survive and you're fit to do it, head on over to our Patreon. Help us thrive in the non-complimentary capitalist marketplace of the current world economy. The Seriously Wrong podcast is like a beautiful butterfly with such lovely wings. Yeah, I say that all the time. But it needs to eat in order to live, like all beautiful butterflies. Yeah, I don't know what butterflies eat, but I think they eat something. And this is a type of butterfly that can just really be fed unlimited. And the more it's fed, the more beautiful wings it has. It's just a direct <laughs> <laughs> that just needs to... <laughs> um, yeah, so if you want to see like a 64 winged, beautiful, seriously wrong butterfly, that's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Currently, we only have about eight wings, I think. Nine, ten. 11 wings i don't know it's it's a metaphorical wing so Mm -hmm. you be the judge but many more wings are possible so donating to the patreon really helps us to make the show and we've got a patreon goal right now that once we hit 1500 patreons we are going to make and uh release a documentary movie that strives to be the coney 2012 of our political ideology it's a bold goal it's a goal that i believe in but (laughs) we need your help to do it And I know how Coney 2012 ended up, and I know the politics of Coney 2012 were never good. Yeah, we're just talking about the effect that it had on the culture, not the people who made it or the reasons they made it for or the effect that it had. None of those things. Yeah, on the Mad Libs of documentary film ideas, we wipe that right out and we fill in new stuff entirely. Yeah, library socialism type stuff. Right. Celebrating by masturbating in my home with the door closed instead of in the street. (laughs) Yeah, so we greatly appreciate everyone who is helping uh, support the show on Patreon. And if you're thinking about doing it, hey, why not give it a shot? Check out some of those bonus episodes and whatnot. And it really helps us. And if you sign up at Beautiful Genius Plus tier, we'll put your name in the credits of that movie when it's done. We'll figure out a cool title for that. We promise the title will be cool. Do not worry about that. 
Yeah, it's not going to be embarrassing. Like, oh, stinkiest losers. Hey, there's my name. What? I, <laughs> <laughs> I upgraded to the beautiful Genius Plus tier for this. Yeah, honestly, I don't even believe that losers exist. So just <laughs> scratch that from your worries. I would never call you that. It'd be something cool. No, oh, yeah, especially not if you're donating to help us make this library socialism documentary movie. Right. I would never call you a loser. Yeah, this is like a don't think of an elephant thing. This is just horrible Patreon asking. Talking about whether or not people are losers. <laughs> we, we call them losers. <laughs> <laughs> We're not fittest when it comes to podcast Patreon ask technology. Well, that's the charm of it, you know? That is the charm. I always like to open up my donation pouch to charming things <laughs> so what do you say open up that donation pouch get on the seriously wrong patreon uh helps make the show happen and also this is the end of the season we're gonna take a little break about a month or so come back with more episodes then we're gonna take a little break we're gonna have our papa and boy come out right our son our son cartoon show on means tv that we are the papa of or the boy of or we're the boy of and it's our papa feels that way sometimes but <laughs> Yeah, we've been working on this thing for so long. We started on this beginning of the pandemic, and it's coming out this summer. Yeah, we don't have a firm date yet, but soon. Next season, we're going to come back bigger, badder, better than ever, create some of the greatest pods of all time. That's the plan. And thank you, everybody, for yeah. listening. And <laughs> Yeah, thanks for listening. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. See you soon. I'm going to go touch some grass. Or lick grass, maybe even. Okay. <laughs> I'm just, just trying to one-up. Touching grass. Oh, because you're going to go so much deeper into nature than I, like so much more. Out I'm going even more outside than you. Look, I'm licking the grass. Mmm. I love eating the grass and the dirt. It's so natural. We'll just pop out that 2,200,000 year old tape. That's so calming to hear back the time that we were born in before we invented a time machine and traveled to the future. It's nice to have remnants of that society we can look back on. If I'd known that I'd only be able to travel forward in time but not backwards, I would have probably brought more than just this one tape, but that's what I get for not understanding time travel fully. You know, look, I made it my life's work, but... Look, Dirk, you did a great job. Hey, well, you really helped me with this. We did it together. It was my dream, but you really helped with the technical know-how. Right, I mean, my the YouTube investment channel wasn't going anywhere. And we were both sterilized. sterilized. And you know what? I don't even mind. There's no humans left to reproduce with. When we traveled 2.2 million years into the future, neither of us expected the three daughter species of Homo sapiens to be grotesque monstrosities. Yeah, honestly, I expected it to just be like idiocracy. Right, I expected an ever greater march towards perfection. We argued about this endlessly. Yeah. Is humanity going to be well along its way to perfection? or is it like idiocracy is literally a documentary and they'll be feeding Gatorade to the crops? You know, this is what spurred us on largely to move oh, yeah. here. And then we find out humanity doesn't even exist and there's just three daughter species. We don't even know if we could reproduce with them. And even if we could, we wouldn't want to because they're so grotesque. I mean, two out of three of them have ears on the back of their head instead of the side of their head. And it's just a subtle thing, but I don't know, it's pretty horrible to look at those two ears so close to each other on the back maybe it's just us being biased i don't know they seem to really love each other's ears but it's something about it, it feels wrong to me i mean those webbed toes and webbed fingers from the million year period they were forced to live at sea during environmental cataclysms where they got their claws yeah the claws Ooh. i mean i see how it could help them survive in concert with the complex intelligence and so on that have been involved with the terrestrial homo sapiens. Yeah, but the social norm of using the claws to scratch at one another to say hello is just for our weak old human skin. Oh, yeah, no, I'm all, I'm all torn up from a week it's, of meeting people. Yeah, and you want to be polite, but then they just, you know, I'm trying to grow my fingernails and turn them into claws, but... Yeah, they're just, it doesn't, it's not the same. And don't even get me started on the sea people. They're flippers, fins, they live under the water. Yeah, I mean, the, the land people do have fins that are not used as well from their time in the sea. Yeah, they came but, from the sea, people went back to land again. They've after. instead evolved very wiry hair and more sort of stout, sort of like gnome-like features, although they're quite tall. They're very stout. 
Whereas the sea hominids, they're more svelte. They've got like longer fingers and toes and so on. Spaghetti fingers is what I call them oh, behind yeah. their back. Creepy stuff. And the way they scratch my forearms, Jesus, is even worse than the land ones. Yeah, because it's so long, the fingers, they can scratch a wider birth of scratching on your body. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's hard to describe to people. Thank God they're all dead. I mean, I'm sad they're all dead, but yeah, me too. I'm happy that at least they didn't live to I mean, see this. Yeah, and then I found out there's a third species. I was excited. Oh, a group of Homo sapiens was split off like two million years ago in space stations, and they've been living up there and successfully reproducing in space for millions of years, separated from the turmoil and events on Earth that pushed humankind into the sea and then pushed half of them back out again. Yeah, finally. So we'll find our home. Ears on the thought. side of the head. So yeah, they flew us up there and um, everyone has enormous heads. Their ears are on the side of them, but they're enormous. Maybe about twice as large as ours, but eyes are still the same size. Yeah, and the bodies are like twice as small. Yeah, just sort of like dangling little dormant weightless bodies because they're in space and their arms are extended. Yeah, and they've evolved sort of air pouches in their heads so they can, in space, fly around you know you're weightless in space anyway but the pouches they help you blow air in different directions mm -hmm. so if you can only blow air in front of you you can only fly in one direction yeah they can blow air out of their ears in directional ways that allows them to position themselves yeah exactly they don't even think about it so they were grotesque as well to us but to not us. to each other no and no they're quite clear that they're attracted to each other up there yeah polyamorous species yeah, and I wouldn't emphasize that if they didn't emphasize it so much, you know? It's just part of their self-image, so the, the flag of their people is the polyamorous pride flag. They just fully took the polyamorous pride flag from the year 2022, where yeah, we're from. Passed. Yeah, well, it's a lonely life uh, in this year as two 2022 version of humans. Right, we're sterilized. Yeah, we're sterilized, but... Actually, if we hadn't been sterilized, we probably, we could have propagated humanity into the future better than if we had been sterilized on that game show yeah maybe we they're selecting for fitness they thought but turns out we were most fit in the long term because we skipped 2.2 million years in the future you know i don't know who's fit who's least fit i find that the older i get the less sure of those things i am but i do know that i enjoy discussing our situation together oh, in thanks. a sort of expositional way it really helps me process yeah me too you know that self-narrativizing is so good for my mental and just yeah. like ex i mean when you're in a context this wild it makes sense that you would explain it and re-explain it and just constantly sort of dwell on it and, and i mean just we're interacting with these human-like post-human species that were pushed by evolution in arbitrary directions but they're still fully intelligent and they became communities that were separated from each other and they're politically like reintegrating now for the first time in like thousands of years so they're very different from each other uh it's unclear if they can reproduce and there's probably going to be some like i don't know there's a lot of different weird scenarios you can imagine we'll see here in our lifetime and yeah whenever i think about that i just sort of start talking about it out loud like this because it's just such a mind fuck i need to explain it yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes I still dream of being able to invent backwards time travel and reverse infertility injections from game shows. But I figure that if they haven't invented that in 2,200,000 years with all this advanced technology that these different species have developed, that maybe maybe it's a lost cause. Yeah, I want to invent backwards time travel and <laughs> sterilization reversing medicine too, man. Maybe we could even backwards time travel to a different period in history that doesn't have things as cruel as sterilizing game shows. Like we don't have to go back to the like our timeline version of 2022 where that's real. Yeah, it's a beautiful dream, but I think we might be stuck here in the post-human future. Yep, only the narrator knows what happens after this. And so Dirk and Kieran time traveled to the future encountering a time that blew their tiny minds so bad that they kept on reiterating what was happening to them in the context that they were in over and over and over again. And I do know what happened to them. I know what happened to them both. And I know what happened to all three of those post-human species. But I'm not telling. Oh, please, Mr. Narrator, please tell No, us. it's important to have a little mystery. If you're explaining, you're losing, they say. That doesn't seem like a good thing to teach narrators, Mr. Narrator. Hey, this is my narration school, and if you don't like it, you can leave.
It's funny you say that because me and the other narration students are staging a walkout that we were planning for the next time you said that because you say it so frequently. Let's go, everyone. Get up. Storm out of here. He said The job of a narrator to explain every detail. We're sick of you refusing to give the juicy deets at the end of important stories. In a world where he never finishes the story. It's annoying. It's not the narration yep, way. that's me. A narration student. Walking out. Probably wondering how I got into this situation. Come on, everybody. It's it's, it's better to have a, mis a little mystery sometimes. Hey, maybe I'll tell you next time. Maybe I'll tell you in another episode. I don't know. Maybe I'll tell you on Patreon. I don't know. Come on. We demand a solid cliffhanger and a promise of the future. None of this mealy mouth maybes. We need to know we'll get an answer eventually. Especially with this being the season break. Okay, I, I promise when we return next season, we'll hear more about what happened to these people in their strange world. Okay? If you keep tuning in... Yay! We've bullied the narration teacher into promising us a resolution. In a world where bullying works. I'm just happy Dirk and Kieran are gonna get the resolution Yay. they deserve. <laughs>